Okay. All right, every, everybody, if I could have silence, please. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the September 15 meeting of the City of Oneonta Planning Commission. Thank you for braving the rain to get out here. Um, Clerk, could you please call the roll, the members? Chair Lappin. Here. Vice Chair Overby is not president or present. Commissioner Maskin. Here. Commissioner Stanton. Here. Commissioner Thomas, not present. Commissioner Dygan. Here. Commissioner Marino. Here. Council Member Risberger. Here. I believe Commissioner Thomas said she couldn't make it. So Correct. She should be excused. Okay, so approval of minutes from the meeting held August 18th. Has everybody had a chance to review them? A motion to accept them. Okay, thank you. Motion made by Commissioner Maskin. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Stanton. Any dis further discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Approved. Okay, um, correspondence. Is there any? You have correspondence, but it relates to particular applications on the agenda. Okay, we'll get to that uh, when we go through our various agenda items. Okay, um, are there, so when we're gonna do public comment, I request that you state your name, uh, the application, what you're making a comment on, and your address. We're going to limit public comment to three minutes, just due to the fact that we have a packed agenda with a lot to discuss. Um, just so you know that we regularly invite public comment in between meetings in writing to help inform our deliberations on various projects. If you feel like the three minute time period is inadequate and you want to express more concerns or issues with a particular application, please send a letter um, via email um, to Ms. Harrington. Okay, are there any petitioners here to address the commission tonight? Yes. Oh, no. oh, or if you're here to make public comments, are there any petitioners here to make public comment? Mr. Baker, if you could please identify your name and address for the record and the application. My name is Jim Baker. I live at 18 Suncrest Terrace in Oneonta, and I'm talking about the Next Amp solar project. First question that I have is that I appreciate your secretary and people for giving us this sheet from last week that I received for the first time. And that is our, of the concerns of the people on our particular area. Most of the concerns are represented here with the exception of a couple of things that I have to uh, assume. I'm assuming that if this goes through, that on the very first page on noise, we talk about inverters. Inverters are the area that makes noise in the process of these solar panels. The positioning of the inverters have to be changed, at least one of them has to be changed, because there is no way, we heard this week where when Hartwick started, we can hear from our back area from the football field normal conversations. That is not normal conversation noise with an inverter. And the inverter that is of concern is on the road, just, just next to the football field. That inverter has to be moved to the back in the space provided. That way it takes us, takes the, I believe that would handle most of the noise. If you look at the inverter on the opposite side, it's way in the back. This one is not in the back, but should be in the back. So it's, it's something that has to be addressed. There is no consideration that we can come up with other than a movement of this. And I don't believe that this is expensive or difficult. So we're asking the particular developer, next amp, and to look this over and make that change. The second thing is, on the water, as far as the drainage and the socks that are there, my question is, how long do the socks last? This is a 30-year period, and we have to know how long they last, and we have to know who's going to replace them when they are no longer usable. 
That's something that has not been addressed here yet. We need that. Along with that, we need to know a telephone number or a person to contact if there is a problem with water. Do we contact the city? Do we contact Hartwick College? Or do we contact Nexan? That has not been explained. We need clarification on that because it's the only way that we can function up there on that hill. We have to have help with that we need to know who to contact. There is also a concern over the water. We left our backyard just a few minutes ago when we had water in our backyard on today's episode. When you totally put solar panels on that particular field that are up there, there's no question that we are going to have water. And we hope that the socks work. Because if the socks don't work, the project doesn't work. So that's something that you people <coughs> who aren't familiar with that hill have to understand is that the surface water is a disaster most of the time and also groundwater is a problem. <coughs> so those two things are extremely difficult. I have, is that my three minutes? Yes. You uh, can conclude your, make your, finish your point and then we'll conclude. The last thing that I'll, I'll say is that uh, if we need to, to direct concerns of water. We need that person's name, whether it's the city again or, or who it is. And it's very important for us. And that's all I'll say. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Baker. Are there any other petitioners wishing to address the commission? Yes, please go ahead. I'm Linda Cyrus, and I live in number 15, Suncrest Terrace. Perhaps you already have this information, but if you do not, I wanted to introduce the record that Jay Fleischer, who was the geology professor at Sumi Onyanta, did a study of that whole area, the geology and hydrology, he called it of Silver Creek and Winnie Hill Creek. And I thought that should be something that should be checked in terms of your environmental impact. That is, I think, the Milne Library. So go with if there's anything you can check the information he found, which was at the time related to a, a university heights development, which is supposed to go up in that same field. And it was uh, voted down because of um, really uh, uh, water issues with Silver Creek and Winnie Hill Creek. So Jay Plusher study geology and hydrology of Silver Creek and Winnie Hill. Yeah, apparently he had, someone has contacted him and he said he would be willing to come and talk after the environmental impact study was completed so he could add whatever he felt was relevant. Okay. Thank you. Is that, are there any other petitioners? Yes, please go ahead. I'm Dave Barnsworth. I'm here as a proxy for my father, Charles, who owns 14 Suncrest. And um, I want to know what the, uh, I've, look, I've looked at the plan. I think the plan is a good plan in terms of controlling the water as far as the distance, the 15 feet outside the perimeter that the company is um, responsible for. My concern and what I want the support of the city is uh, the existing um, ditch that's there and the exist when they put those fields up there 30 years ago, um, because of the, the groundwater, it was not supposed to be a suitable building site for something like that. Then miraculously, when uh, Mayor Miller became mayor, it suddenly got changed. The zoning got changed to allow something like that to go up on that hill. And <clears throat> we've had water issues ever since, um, ruining foundations and walls and lawns and you name it. Um, so what is already there is insufficient. I'm concerned about all this new water that's going to dump into that existing stuff and I'm not concerned about NEXAMP's responsibility. I want to know what Harvard College's responsibility to this project is and to the residents of the city because they were supposed to take care of these issues all along and none of those things were ever addressed or maintained. And this, this could be a disastrous uh, um, amount of water coming down off that hill from this project. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? 
happy to address the commission. Yes, please go ahead. Um, Identify your, if yourself yes. and your address, please, and the application. Yep, Scott Thomas, 6 Wells Ave, uh, application number 3. Uh, we weren't sure if the applicant was about to uh, we just have some concerns because the original plan submitted back in 2018 the zoning commission that was approved approved for 560 square foot cottages uh, even before the meeting uh, Ms. Drake assured us there would be tiny cute little cabins with a bathhouse no parties none of that um, she assured us a fence for privacy. Um, since that time, two have been built. They are well over 900 plus square feet. And her listing, which has been changed in the last couple of weeks, um, she's all, uh, advertising a party pavilion. Every party is here. Uh, our driveway borders that that property. We put up a basketball for our son to play with. Um, at least once a week, sometimes more, each of the renters used it. Some used it to park in a couple times. Um, I think the fence that was promised would clearly define that property line. Um, we're a residential neighborhood. We have a young child. We don't need parties on every night. We keep our vacation and split it. But it's nothing what she assured us it would be. It's the exact opposite. Oh, thank you. Any other petitioners wishing to address the commission? Yes, sir, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Michael G. Miller. I live at 12 Wells Ave. And I voted in favor of the running to base, you know, the baseball cabin. And if I had to do it over, I wouldn't vote that way. It's too built. Every, it seems like every eight days or whatever, to 10 at night, it's loud noises. They're in my yard. I lease a vehicle, cost me two grand to fix it because the baseball sitting in it, four broken windows. And I, they said, friend, we gotta get security cameras. I did submit to put a fence up, but then COVID came, so I wanted to give Linda a break because I knew you could construct something in rat and it's, it's not cheap. But uh, I still don't have a fence, and I don't even know if a fence is gonna stop baseball. There's a vacant lot, actually Linda holds between us. Ben Wells have, and they play baseball. Well, that's what young people do, and they're enjoying themselves. And but it's, uh, it's I even with the Senate Roberacker, and baseball is pretty much what we got in this area. I don't want to upset the apple cart, but we got to look within the city like Milford did. And I don't want no more of it. Not next to me, because I don't think any of you people would want it next to you. Oh, thank you. I'm Ariel. I live at 11 Wells Avenue. And I just want to say I want to support the neighbors on that side of the property because they feel that what Linda Drake originally presented to them um, is not what has happened. So I'm here actually to support them. And the honest truth is, I don't mind it if it's kept relatively quaint. I enjoy watching the kids all out there playing. Excuse me. But if it becomes too much and you know, there's too many of those homes built. Where are the kids going to play? You know, then they're going to be out in the street, and then we have a safety, you know, concern. And, and then they're, you know, depending on how many are built, um, and whether or not they have an area to to walk around and play in, that's great. But it becomes part, you know, into the street, and it becomes a safety concern. Then it, you know, then parking. yeah, parking is uh, parking is actually a concern of my husband who wasn't able to. So um, that's it. I'm here to support them. If if we can keep it as promised, when we originally all said it was fine, so with the fencing and the size and how many, the quantity of them, then that's great. But it sounds like people are just going ahead and doing their own thing. Thank you. Prove me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other petitioners wishing to address the commission? Okay, we will move on um, past the petitioners portion of the agenda.
And we will start with our first agenda item, which is the Gamify Delta application. We've been holding this particular project up for the last three commission meetings. Or is there any uh, person from 23 Elm Street or Gamify Delta available to address the commission tonight? Okay, so um, I guess we'll open the floor for discussion on how we wish to proceed. This will now be the fourth consecutive meeting that the representatives from Gamify Delta have failed to attend. It's my inclination that we um, deny this essentially deny the special use permit and direct them to reapply um, because each time the applicant we have this a particular application on the agenda we have to send notice mail to them and pay postage it costs the city month time and resources that you know aren't um, I guess utilized by the applicant so what, what is everybody's feeling about that thank you should uh, Scrub it. Are they operating as a sorority house at the moment? So they are, as far as we understand it. Um, I met with Hartwick's uh, Greek Life people. Mm -hmm. uh, two of those Greek Life people I met with both left their positions before the school year started. So we we're kind of in a little bit of turmoil with Hartwick in regards to proceeding with the Greek Life stuff. Um, <coughs> In the interim, Paul Habernick has kind of taken back over in that role. So I think that we will probably be moving all of these applications through him until we can kind of figure out what Hartwick's going to do. Uh, but yeah, I would recommend that you, we just send them a letter that says their application, as it's been presented, is denied. And, you know. So uh, I would agree with you. Would the plan then be to ticket them for being over-occupied in that house? I think that with where we're at right now with all the houses, we've sent out um, inspection requirements. We kind of we we changed the the process from last year to this year. Um, we made the all the houses last year come in for special use permits, despite the whole COVID thing, um, with the intention that we would bring them back in the fall. Because instead of doing these applications at the end of the year, we're going to do it at the beginning of the year. Um, the intent was kind of to reestablish how we're doing these because we have kind of a bit of um, institutional kind of loss. We basically had two years with COVID where we don't have contacts for these fraternity and story houses. It's kind of been an uphill battle to get to where we're at now. Um, so I, I think we could uh, send them a notice of violation with the intent of Giving their attention, uh, I would be hesitant to. I mean, the problem that we have is we're not sure that the person we're sending notice to even was in the property anymore, or is receiving the notifications. So, maybe, so why don't? Um, so one possible step could be to contact the remaining individual at Hartwick who's in charge of Greek Life. Say who is right. the contact at Gamify Delta give him you know, a specified period of time to get back to us? So we've, we've drafted uh, what we call the welcome letter that we always send to the colleges. Uh, that's being provided to Hartwick and they're gonna distribute those along with the special use permit applications and all the, we're going through the college to notify the houses instead of us trying to individually notify them through uh, contacts okay. that we have. Okay, so maybe then we can say that with this particular application, since they failed to appear to renew, we give them a certain amount of time, 30 days, to reapply or receive a notice of violation. I think that's fair. I mean, we've, it's been beyond fair. We've given them four months now. Right. And this has made a good faith effort to accommodate them at our meeting. And uh, yeah, so, Damn. yes. Just so for our sororities and our fraternities, when we notify them, we notify the house. The house. Right. We do not notify individual contacts. So our notices to them are being confirmed as delivered by the post office so with their COVID-19 protocols, or a couple of them have been returned as they're just not claiming them. So it's not. Huh. So, so it, it's not, we, it's, okay. this so particular one isn't that we don't have an improper contact, so it's their. I think we've been more than fair. So we just, so in this case, we 
deny the um, special use permit application and then give them 30 maybe give them 30 days and then issue the notice of violation I mean so that a notice of violation would give them 30 days yeah so, so that's why I, so say, I, I think that we would be safely within our capabilities of saying you have by the next meeting to yeah. submit a complete application and prepare for the board if not so that's what the notice of violation would include uh, that's what the notice of violation would include okay so I believe we have a course of action. Do I have a motion to deny the special use permit on the grounds that the applicant failed to show up? So moved. Oh, second. Motion made by Commissioner Maskin, seconded by Commissioner Stanton. Any discussion? Are we adding that we're going to send a notice of violation, or is that? I think that's the next part. step. Oh, okay. yeah, part of it. Um, okay. Um, hearing no further discussion, aside from Commissioner Digan's question. Um, Please call the roll of the vote. Chair Lappin? Yes. Commissioner Maskin? Yes. Commissioner Stanton? Yes. Commissioner Digan? Yes. Commissioner Marino? Yes. Passes. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, we have Keith and Gail Volk, 54 West Broadway. Um, if you could please let us know what you're trying to do and um, go from there. Pardon me, we're. Are you speaking to me? Yes. Mr. <laughs> We're demolishing your old forts and replacing it with a new one. Pretty straightforward. It meets all the um, setback requirements. So, so this is a pr this particular portion is an MU2. Uh, the code basically says that alterations in an MU2 require site plan approval. Um, this could potentially be considered a repair but it's being enclosed so there's a change in the kind of the space how it's being used okay um, which is why it's here basically it's it's, it's an enclosed front porch approximately the same size as the existing portion in mv2 where there's minimal setback requirements minimal. it's basically here because we require site plate approval for additions yeah it's, it's pretty straightforward application um, okay, so this is you know, a clearly a uh, type two action under Seeker, um, and the specific provision would be um, six NYC RR Part six seventeen uh, subpart eleven, which involves the construction or expansion of a single family or two family or three family resident on an approved lot including provision of necessary utility co connections as provided in paragraph 13 of the subdivision and the installation, maintenance, upgrade, or drinking water well. So basically, residential activity. Yeah. Um, okay, do I have a motion to classify the action as a type two? So moved. Motion Second. made by Commissioner Diagon, seconded by Commissioner Marino. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, would you please call the roll? Chair Lappin? Yes. Commissioner Maskin? Yes. Commissioner Stanton? Yes. Commissioner Diagon? Yes. Commissioner Marino. Yes. Passes. So, um, does anybody have any questions about the site plan as presented? Looks straightforward to me. Um, open the floor for a motion for site plan approval as presented. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Diagon. Do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Maskin. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, could you please call the roll? Chair Lappin? Yes. Commissioner Maskin? Yes. Commissioner Stanton? Yes. Commissioner Digan? Yes. Commissioner Marino? Yes. Passes? Passes, thank you. Mr. Volk, thank you very much. Thank you. You're approved. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, I believe we have uh, Ms. Linda Drake, 14 Susquehanna Avenue. Um, I believe you're seeking a site plan. Uh, modification request so I'd like to kind of ask for you to give a background of your project and the history of your interaction with the city and then I'll kind of ask our code enforcer Steve Yearly for a little bit more supporting information Great. so in 2018 I submitted plans to the city um, to build six cabins structures um, on 14 Susquehanna Street um, two out of those six were built. It was a, a 
full plan to begin with, not to build all at once. Um, and with those uh, two buildings is also a pavilion, um, which has a bathroom in it and laundry. It sits on almost an acre of land. It's very large. Um, and so they are I'm a real stickler for following the rules, so everything is built exactly the way the site plan um, was written um, to code. Codes were there all the time when we were building it, so we made sure that we built it according to all the rules. Um, we had the first year, they weren't even finished until the end of the summer, so I rented them twice. Last year I rented them zero. This year I rented the cabins only three times. Um, and the first time I rented it, um, our neighbors, uh, Sheila and Scott had just put up a new basketball hoop next door and she called me and said they were over there so I went right to the property and asked them not to do that anymore. Um, and it's also respecting my neighbors and all their manuals inside the house. It tells them not to um, you know, trespass and be respectful to our neighbors. Um, so that's important to me. So. <coughs> Um, I have always worked closely with the code, so as soon as I um, got the letter about the, um, in August, about the fence needing to be put up um, around both properties, which originally we only, in this kind of a meeting, we had, we had a letter from my uh, builder only, um, then I called the codes right away and had um, come and look at the, um, fence. So there is approximately 37 feet that does not have a fence around it from um, the edge of my property to Sheila's and then they have a chain link fence all around their, their yard already. Um, and then I have another house where I raised my family in between both Sheila and Mike's house. Um, and so that yard is merges into the other yard. So if there is a problem um, other than that basketball hoop, they haven't ever called me about that. Or I would come down in a second to take care of that. And the pavilion is quite away from the any of their houses, so if there was that much noise, um, they should certainly complain and certainly even call the police because it's quite a ways from their house. Um, to my knowledge, there was only one gathering there this year, and I went over um, because that was when they played on her basketball hoop. So I went over and, um, twice then, and then I went over at 9 o'clock and told them to make sure to shut it down, which they did. Um, so we're here. I'm not going to extend my building permit um, because of recovery from a, a zero COVID year. Um, so for now, we're going to have two cabins, which are shut down completely in the winter. In October, they're shut down, they're drained out, and then they open again in the summer. Um, so um, for now, we will have only the two cabins in the pavilion there. But, so if I might ask a question, so you do have plans in the future to build? The site plan has a total of six of those structures there. Approved. That were approved. Those, those were approved? Correct. Yes. And so, and those were approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Correct. And so the purpose of this sketch plan um, is basically to, you know, examine the current site plan. So and as a part of a sketch plan conference, you're not requesting. So for some background on this, this particular parcel is a large parcel. It's in a CI zone. Uh, the code does not allow more than one primary structure on a parcel. So with this particular application, with the request of six, uh, what could be considered primary structures along with the pavilion, they had to seek zoning board approval for the, the initial project. The zoning board of appeals granted an approval for those structures, uh, citing that because it's a CI zone, uh, because they're less intense use than what could be done in a CI zone, that the six 
individual structures in one pavilion were an acceptable variance from the primary structure requirement of the code. They approved the site plan. Uh, within the site plan approval, uh, the zoning board determined that they needed to provide a fence to provide privacy. Um, that's all the decision letter says. Uh, based it didn't on say the, what type of fence. Right. Based on that approval, we really don't have any um, guidance on the fence. The other issue that we kind of have with this is because this was an approved site plan, to close the site plan, you would need to build all of the cabins and then theoretically the fence would be finished whenever the site plan was completed. So, so, in, so in order to approve, you know, close this application, so essentially this application would just remain open until... Theoretically, I mean, there's no real way to... The, the issue that, that is created is that you have two completed structures and one pavilion with no fence, but an approval for four additional cabins to be built before the site plan is technically closed. Okay, so... so the question becomes, can you occupy those buildings without site, with the site plan still being open? Can you close the, the application process or the site plan process if the site plan hasn't been completed? And if not, if the applicant wants to occupy those buildings, what needs to be done to modify the site plan if the intent is not to build those cabins for another four years? So is there an intention to build the cabins at all in the future? In the future, yes, but so then in the long term future, in which case I would have to I'm aware from guidance that I would have to submit a whole nother plan, a whole new plan. Is that correct, Steve? We would they, so they already issued um a variant you know, the site plan and variance approval um for the six cabins and then our our job would then be to, to determine if a the site plan should be modified in any way, right? Yeah. So I mean, the, the question becomes: site plans expire if they're not closed. Right. So if Linda doesn't maintain an active building permit, which then becomes, well, how do you occupy a site with an open building permit that you can't secure? We can't close the site plan, and we can't close the building permit. I mean, theoretically, you, you would never occupy those structures because we could never issue any sort. We could issue COs on individual buildings, but how do you close a site plan? How do you... Without the actual structures being built. Right, and how do you determine when a fence needs to be installed if technically the site plan is still open, but the cabins are finished? <coughs> so, that's tricky. It's a, it's a conundrum. So, I guess kind of my initial thought would be that this commission would is the other the other difficult piece is that the zoning board of appeals did not issue a written determination outlining the parameters of their approval um, why they approved what they did mm -hmm. they didn't um, did they outline any of the use for reasons for compliance with the use for ends criteria or like the kind of how the site plan would work uh, the approval would work in terms of the compliance with the city code so they so in this case so i guess i ask these questions because <clears throat> under the sketch plan conference kind of those guidelines in our code we could require more plans or different types of plans or other documents to support the site plan and because the site plan was our this particular plan was already approved by the zba i guess the qu first question we have to answer is whether their approval of the site plan was adequate, but, but we don't really have anything to go on because they just approved it basically, right? Um, and so that creates, that basically forces us to revisit the site plan. But then again, Ms. Drake's already been operating the business. So to, to say like, well, we can't continue to operate it. I feel like I worry about a takings issue or a you know, constitutional problem. With that, you're just saying you, you know we're going to stop you until we figure this whole thing out. That's another that is a legal issue for me. Um, so I recommended to Linda Drake to bring this as a site plan modification, so that the planning commission could determine the fence, the fence location, um, 
basically modify the site plan into something that we can work off of. Okay. Understanding that currently we have nothing other than an approved site plan, which requires a fence, and a zoning variance that allows for multiple primary structures on a property. Um, understanding that in the CI zone there is no requirement for fences, buffering. Right, but then the, the site plan review code allows us gives us the power to require that if Correct. We, we so want. So then that, that's... Sorry, yeah, if you, you have a question, please so go ahead. The, <clears throat> if I fenced in both the neighbor's property, the original letter from, the original meeting was from Mike to ask that we fence in his property when the, when the um, plan was finished, which I agreed to, and now it's become both uh, neighbors, and that's a total of 470 um, feet of fences, which is $17,750 um, to put a, a fence in, and I feel <clears throat> that for Sheila's property, if we just put in um, that 37 feet, we well, don't know what I'm, <laughs> what it looks like, um, then at least her, she already has a fence around the property, at least that would um, take care of her driveway piece, um, which is where our folks, um, our, our, our tenants, um, so we'll um, so we'll allow you guys to ask some questions, but we're not going to entertain like a back and forth. So if you just please ask your questions and allow us to proceed, appreciate. It. Go, uh, please, sir. Okay. Go I, um, I stated I think in my letter, which is in the minutes, uh, Michael G. Miller, that I'm not requiring Linda to build this fence all the way. I'd like it now, but I'm not going to change. All I requested was my back deck have a fence, uh, approximately. My driveway's 80 feet. I didn't even want that, but just enough so it covers my deck and my house so when the balls break my windows and my vehicles, I got a little protection. That's all I'm asking for. And I thought we had an agreement with that. I agreed to that. Yeah, but and I, then COVID came, so I don't make a thing out of it. And it was difficult. And, like Linda stated, she's not running, and I don't want to fight with the neighbors. I know the Thomases and none of us do, but like I said, if I had to do it over, right, we probably wouldn't be here. But we got to really take into consideration these baseball rules. I don't care if it's zoned that way or not, because you know, a little social responsibility. The rents are, you know, everyone's making money, like Senator Oberhofer said, but also it's driving out affordable rent. I never would have been able to afford the rent. I worked for the city for 31 years. So we got to start thinking about this stuff. We're going to put them in our inner in our community and build a complex. It looks like a complex, and there is fences around Country Club Golf Course. That's not even a resident. Yeah, we didn't have a fence, and it's not. See, Linda has a house between us. That's not part of the cabins, but the property's connected. That has tenants coming and going. Uh, where she grew up, she don't live there. That's a rental too now. And it seems like, you know, that's where they play. And if you build, what would it be? Four more units? You're going, that's the field they're playing. I mean, they're young kids. They're there for baseball world. The parents are there to have a few beers every night. I bet the cops said, well, they can party till 10. Well, great. You put it next to your house and party till 10. I'll come up and turn on my music and hang out. You won't like it. You got to think about this. Thank you. Please go ahead. I've got a concern that, correct me if I'm wrong, that the original plan called for those cabins to be 560 square feet, square feet and then they're not. So are we going to continue with four more that aren't 560? The, the site plan was approved with construction drawings that were submitted. The construction drawings that were submitted match the dimensions of what's been built. So I would, you would have to default to whatever the zoning board approved. So they approved the construction drawings. They approved the drawings that were submitted yep. as part of the application. Okay. So they were approved the size they are. Correct. So okay. it looks like it is. But it's not 500, it's like the minutes. It's over a thousand. So They're two stories. Like They're like a two-story little barn thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty
empty. So the actual dimensions of like of the first floor is like twenty by twenty eight. So yeah, so I think what's what's happened here is I think the the actual footprint of the building might be that, but they're like a two story barn. They have like stairs on them. There's like a little loft. So it's basically. And I think that was clarified at the zoning board meeting with the construction plans. So that's basically 488 square feet. Per floor. Per, per, per floor. Yeah, but the total like footprint of like the you know, physical. Building is like 500. 500 square feet, okay. We, we had codes with us the whole way so that we did everything right. Okay. Oh, I, we appreciate that. I mean, I understand and I appreciate everybody's, I, mean, I believe this gentleman actually had a question, so I will. No. Okay. So I appreciate everybody's input. You know, it's a small community. We all, everyone should be entitled to realize a reasonable rate of return from their property, but at the same time, in, allow reasonable people should also be afforded the chance to enjoy their property too. So I guess where we begin the discussion is regarding the fence and screening. Or, and whether we feel that is necessary as a commission. So I'll open the floor. What do you guys think? Can, I, I just have a quick question, sure. actually for, probably for Stephen about the fencing, because I've heard uh, a chain link fence being brought up, but also what was approved through zoning? Was that a privacy fence? It was it just- It says a fence for privacy. For privacy, which is not a chain link fence. That which I would provide. say would not meet the intent yeah. of that. Okay. So what we're looking for, you know, so I guess the term wording in this, in that original site plan approval was a fence for privacy. So we're interpreting that to mean privacy fence, is that correct? Something that would obstruct. Yeah. Something that would reasonably obstruct the view. Okay. Um, other thoughts at the commission? I would just want to clarify what exactly we are trying to achieve here. So, so are, we, are we reviewing it as just its current form as two units? We are, the site that? plan approval was for six units. We're looking to, we're just trying to determine whether we should modify the site plan approval with the goal, purpose of addressing some issues of like, I guess, unclear issues associated with the original approval, such as the fencing, when it should be built, how much, what the dimensions of said fence should be, and kind of where they would cover. Basically, what, what does this fence look like and when should it be installed? And how Right. So, I mean, basically we have an approved site plan, but we have no actual mechanism as to what the fence is, where the fence is, when is the fence built. Um, okay. Yeah. And I guess it, the yeah. other kind of conundrum we have is without an active building permit, this site plan will expire. Well, that was my kind of, that was my sort of where I'm getting at. So here. they, so in order to need, in order to get the building permit, they would have to build all six. Is that so? Basically, the way I see this going is, unless there's a renewed building permit, this site plan would be essentially void. Basically. void. So then, in order for them to continue their, I guess, long-term plan, the applicant would need have to, to come back and get another site plan. Would have to come back and, or would they, or they could, could they renew their building permit application? But if they did that, they would need another site plan, right? Right. Okay. They would be building structures that exceed 200 square feet. And when would the site plan expire? The site plan will expire. The, the site plan will expire essentially when the building permit expires, which is basically now. Okay, so the building I'm, permit will be expiring. So in this case, um, so I guess if we were to not do anything, the building permit would expire, and they'd be stuck with the two buildings and have to reapply for site plan. But then they also couldn't occupy. That's the question of. I mean, would we then invalidate? CEOs. finished buildings over a fence. I mean, yes. that's kind of why this is here. And I recommended that the applicant modify their site plan to get clarification on the fence. Yeah, so my, so my thought seems in order to avoid a major headache, we deal with the fence today, basically. Correct. Are you, can I ask a question to the applicant? Are you planning on building next summer? Like when is, what is your, that's long-term? Yeah, it's, it's a long-term because <clears throat> the original plan was have a successful summer, which we didn't have during COVID. And then based on that, we build two more. But we haven't had a successful summer last during COVID. This summer, I rented those cabins three times, the whole summer, not together, like individually. Um, so 
I don't know when I'll have the money to continue it, but I will continue it eventually. So would it make sense to just approve a site plan modification saying like we figure out the fence situation and we just approve for two buildings with a some sort of fence and then close that out and then if yeah. she wants to build more later on she can come back yeah we would um but approve it as just two buildings or yeah we can approve the site plan now but if they were to come back we would have to redo the whole seeker analysis for the entire property essentially to avoid a segmented review right right um so yeah i think that um that's a good process i think i think we should probably define you know what type of fence and how tall and then be it, how much? <laughs> and then how much it's kind of um 470 feet approximately or 570 feet of fence is 97 panels but then the other the other alternative could be to have those kind of you know the certain types of trees that would obscure too like <clears throat> planting that would kind of act as a fence but that kind of also goes outside the intent of the zba is the intent of the fence to give privacy or is it to prevent baseballs i think it's to give privacy that's what prevent baseballs because they're going to go over the fence so, so theoretically oh, okay. maybe maybe the uh, maybe the other issue would be to you know if, you know it'd be a voluntary piece but to say that you know we're not to allow like people to play baseball in the backyard where could, the balls could just fly into someone's yard or cause property damage or well as it's written now i tell people when they come and i have a manual inside the house that gives the rules so essentially i have two yards one where i raised my family which is in between um mike and sheila's house and then the cabins and so what is written is you play baseball in the cabin's yard which is really big so if there's been a problem and if they've been playing in the yard next to the main house i've never heard of uh, that as a problem yet so then so i guess you know part of this it kind of involves like a trust exercise between yourself and the neighbors but and that's something that i try i really hope can be improved from what i've seen and i believe we have correspondence from Mr. Scott and Mrs. Sheila Thomas that um, will be read into the record. So if you could please read the letter. Thank you. To the Planning Commission. This is a letter stating our concerns and issues with the rental properties at 14 Susquehanna Street, Oneonta, New York. This is regarding the conditions set by the Zoning and Housing Board of Appeals that the property owner of 14 Susquehanna Street construct a fence to provide privacy for her neighbors. Our property is directly bordering the construction of the barns built and the prospective additional barns. We had a conversation with Linda Drake prior to the Zoning and Housing Board of Appeals meeting on June 25, 2018. During that conversation, we asked Linda Drake to provide a privacy fence between our property and the barns at 14 Susquehanna Street. At that time, Linda Drake gave us her word that she would erect a privacy fence. We took her at face value and trusted she would stand by her word. We always had a good relationship with Linda Drake and had no reason not to trust she would do what we wished. To date, the fence has not been constructed or started. However, barns have been rented for the past two years. Over the summer 2021, there were three or four parties at the properties at 14 Susquehanna and 8-10 Wells Avenue of about 30 or more people. 8-10 Wells Avenue is to the left of our house and part of 14 Susquehanna Street is directly behind the house. So during the rental time, we are surrounded by renters. During these times, we felt like our enjoyment of our own backyard that we pay taxes on was greatly diminished. We also had issues with our basketball hoop in our driveway, which is at the back of our yard and next to her property. We consistently had people playing basketball there and had to inform them that it was private property not included with their rental. Our concern was if someone got hurt or broke our hoop, we would be stuck with the aftermath of that. A fence would clearly define the area for the renters. We are requesting and hoping the Planning Commission ensures the fence to provide privacy be erected prior to any future rentals of barns and any new construction on 14 Susquehanna Street. We are also concerned and looking for clarification on the size of the cabins. During the above mentioned discussion with Linda Drake, she also stated the cabins would be cute Amish barn cabins and a bathhouse. The cute Amish barn cabins turned into much larger barns on completion. The bathhouse turned into a pavilion that was previously advertised as a party pavilion. This has since been changed in her listing of the properties. 
The Zoning and Housing Board of Appeals meeting minutes state that the final site will include six cottages that are approximately 560 square feet and accessory structure that will contain additional bathrooms, laundry, and on-site storage. However, the barns that are built are advertised as being 1,000 square feet and advertised to sleep eight. Four more cabins of this size would be potentially 48 people surrounding our yard every summer. The blatant disregard for what was proposed verbally to us and what was in the Zoning and Housing Board of Appeals minutes has us very concerned about the future of the property at 14 Susquehanna Street, Oneonta, New York. We understand we are in an area with minimal zoning conditions. However, there are homes and families that live here. We don't think that our area can sustain four additional barns of 1,000 square feet. Our enjoyment of our own properties we hope will be important to the Planning Commission. Please keep in mind Linda Drake does not live in this area. Her privacy is not affected by any of this. The cabins are for solely for her, excuse me, are solely for profit. We are hoping the Planning Commission will take this into consideration. We are hoping the Planning Commission will count the two larger barns as four of the structures that should have been built, allowing at most only two more structures of the 560 square feet. We are requesting if the Planning Commission gives the okay for the additional barns, that they will ensure that they are built no larger than 560 square feet. These are transient people that will be coming into these homes, staying for a week and leaving. While many renters will come and go without incident, we feel provisions need to be in place so we can all enjoy our properties we have worked hard to maintain. Sincerely, Scott Thomas, Sheila Thomas. Thank you. So how do we want to proceed on this? Ideas. Okay, so what's the story with the what, what's the deal with the barns structure? The extra. I think structures? they're referring there's to. There's a picture. Yeah, there's there's a picture is in the packet. But is that not part of the original approval? That was all part of the original approval. So the the photo that's included in the packet, I didn't see the construction drawings, but there was there was a set of construction drawings that was submitted with the packet. Um, yeah, so that's all part of the original site. So I'm just doing a quick um, measure. On the, I'm on the Otsego County GIS map. Um, and it, and I, from my measure from Susquehanna Avenue all the way, I guess, to, to the t parcel like 300.7-5-15, that is about 230 feet, linear feet, according to the, the map. So I'm not really sure where, like, how you get the arrive at the number 400 square feet of fence, or 400 feet of fence. For the fence, you mean? Yeah. Because you have to do this L shape to go around Sheila's property, and then you have to do the L shape to go around Mike's property. I had two different fence people give me an estimate, and they came up with a very similar price of four. It's because Dan, you have to go around Linda's two parcels in the middle. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that that would be one of the questions about this fence. I mean, is there a requirement that the fence be installed around both properties, or is it a requirement that the fence be installed running parallel to the property line or the the property line of Susquehanna, and not? I mean, that that's where the clarification would come from. Yeah. What are, what are we, what is the fence? Where is the fence located? What does the fence entail? And the main purpose of this fence is to define what area is okay to go in and what is not, right? It's not gonna, or are we trying Take to stop? Out of their yards. We're not trying to stop baseballs, right? Correct. So I think it's it's probably pretty clear, I'm assuming. I mean, I don't oh, know. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. But it's probably pretty clear the border between Linda Drake's main property and parcels to the north and south of it. I would assume that is pretty well understood or is that incorrect? So it's mainly the problem is in the rear of these properties on the west side. Right. Right. So the two, so you're talking about the two par the two parcels, like the one in the middle and then the one, one in the middle, I'm assuming that is pretty well defined. Yeah. Well, no, not, I mean, there's a house there. Right? Yeah. But the one in the back is the one we're having an issue with. Someone has a basketball court. <laughs> If you, I, I know you can see this, but here is Scott and Sheila's house. Here's their fence that they have up a link fence. The, the property that our tenants have trespassed on is this little piece right here that has a basketball hoop on it. <clears throat> and the reason that they use the basketball hoop is because 
no fault of Scott and Sheila's, but when they built this fence, there was a garage there. So now there's not. So visually, it looks like, from anybody looking, that it's her, their property. And so if we put a fence here. Oh, I see. Okay. Then it's very clear. Right now, this is how the fence is, and this is their, their old driveway and garage. And so this looks like it's part of oh, us, so it would it's just not. Okay, so then the issues with that, that like back space, that back parcel is the where the issues are, and then. And then Steve's house or, or Mike Miller's house is over here, <clears throat> and these are really big maple trees and pine trees that go to the ground. Um, so initially, yeah. Mike wrote a letter that said, I, "My understanding is right that the fence go here." Okay. Yeah, I'm not asking for a fence around my property, so you can say and put it out of town. I just want it along the driveway, Linda, and the highway, so I don't get bombarded because they play in that lot. So you want it from your driveway to your garage? No, 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 no. You know where my garage is? Yes. Put it there because my deck looks right there at the, I call it Amish Barns, which they're not ugly. And then the side lot, excuse me. So, you know, like, I couldn't guess, I, what is that, 40 feet, 30, you know, and the rest could be top. But that's all I ever asked for. Um, so you don't need to fence the back of my property. Yeah, it'd be really nice. Who wouldn't turn that down on any day? But you don't need to. I'm just asking for a privacy fence, like a like this behind you. That would be white, I guess, solid. Like yeah. So like the wood. Yeah, the wood wood privacy. Well, I've seen where the cabins are going to be, and they probably go where I might be looking to the rear. But I do have pines, and I'm not going to be that difficult about it. I, like I said, I wouldn't do it again, but we've done it. I'm not, I don't think any of us want to shut down and you can't have these cabins. But in the future, we got to look at the size. But as of right now, at the top, that they could get a fence, like Linda sees their properties more exposed. And I'm asking just for a, where my deck is and a little, guard my two windows, you know. So I know maybe you have to get back and do the exact thing, but I'm not asking. So that's so, that, that's so that's like the sketch plan. Yeah, kind of, or it's all we're doing right now is a sketch plan. So that yeah. what I'm seeing is that, so between the part. My driveway is 80 feet and it could be a lot less. I'm not asking even for all that. I don't need my whole property. I have a good sized lot and there's all another, slots down there. And then there's another, another adjoining property owner is also requesting screening. Is that correct? In the back. In the back. And on the back side of the, I guess of the property line. So. Okay, so. Yeah, do you have the, you have the county map, up? Right? Yeah, so I have the, um, the driveway. Uh, it's 12 and then there's a big lot, 10 actually. Yeah, for for twelve, and so this would be then. Um, Michael G. Miller's property. You don't even need to go the whole length. I just would like a little bit. Yeah, my deck sits there. You, you know, that's what I wrote in my original. Okay, okay. I, so I, I see what you're talking about, yeah. Mr. Miller. So it's basically, game, so. it's basically, if you have the site, big site plan in front of you, it's that, um, I guess it's like kind of this piece right there. I trust you. <laughs> so it's hard to see. So we have that. That's, and then we're asking... And then the other property, um, oh geez, I went, zoomed all the way out. Anyways. Okay, so then the other, the other piece is we can, that, um, Kind of amount of screening is not too bad, but then the other, the other question is the uh, remaining screening along the back side. So how? What is our feeling about that? That's 
the other property, not mine, correct? Correct. Because yeah. I'm fine in the rear. I think that one would benefit from a fence if, if people are really trespassing regularly. On this side or the entire thing? Uh, we're talking about the basketball. Right here? Just in the back of the basketball hoop, yeah. Yeah. So this... Here's that. So it looks Scott like... Thomas. I agree. So, so it looks like... The fence, you know, in that case, the fence would be about an L. Would it need to be an L or just a straight straight back? Um, from the road to this part of the fence is 80 feet. This whole straight piece. That's his parcel is 80 feet wide. From the road to the where his, his chain link fence stops. Yeah, so that's about 80 feet and then going along the... This one, and I don't have that, I didn't measure that part. And so going along the back side of the property... The back side of the property is yeah. easy. No. This, yeah. Yeah, this is that yeah. So then I, so. I'm trying to pull up that. As well. mm -hmm. So it looks like we, we're kind of, are we? We're kind of are we settled on the fence going along the back side of the property? I just want to be clear. It's a straight. We're talking about just a straight fence going on the on the western edge of Scott Thomas's property. Yeah. The road to the corner. The road to the corner of his property. Corner with Linda Drake's property to the south. Straight line. So this is Scott Thomas. So that's a fence going down the back side from the road. From Susquehanna. Down to Linda Drake's corner. Down to Linda Drake's corner, on the back side, correct? Right. Okay, that's one. And then there's the uh, Mr. Miller. And that's yeah, it's about like 80 feet. So the other one is Mr. Miller's fence. That's all we need, 80 feet. So if we can agree, it just show me like visually where you want. Yeah, to, I mean, I'll I'll do it. probably half. And then if they help the time. So, <clears throat> so so maybe. What we could think about is essentially using this as a sketch plan conference, okay. recommending to the applicant to meet with the neighbors to establish approximately where these fences would be located. That's a good, that's a good idea. Okay, so why don't we... create that on a site plan and then come back next month so that we can actually establish where all this fencing would be located and who is getting fenced great, where. Great idea. So let's do that. Okay. Um, we so should, we, uh, should we uh, establish... What kind of fence? How high? Yeah, I think you can yeah. establish a type of fencing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how, so the type of fence. Actual location. So how about like a wood, like a wooden privacy fence that's about six feet, like a normal like six foot fence? The estimate I got was based on a six by eight wooden fence. And you also should know that they said that um, the fence company said that the um, sections now are kind of finished for the season so we couldn't do it until spring no i'm not worried until spring. but but you said you aren't gonna that you're shutting these cabins down anyway so right. theoretically yeah, there'd be no one there i'm just saying if you say hey you have you know so you gotta have the fence built by i can't yeah so my my th so what i think we're going to do is we're going to agree on the type of fence and then we're going to ask you to establish the specific dimensions with your neighbors and come back for a site plan approval on that okay. and you could Theoretically, just use this existing site plan drawing to, to just draw over, you know, draw over with where like a, this fence with like is a pen, be. a highlighter, yeah, basically that you would, and then include the specific dimensions of the fence. That way, we could actually approve something, and then we would just ask that you come back next month after doing that. Are we in agreement? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, can I have one question? Uh, you said wooden fence, and Linda gets an estimate. Everything's kosher. You all agree on the distance, height. You put it in the minutes. I just don't have to be backward if I said <clears throat> I'll spend X and make that fence nicer out of my pocket with the, whatever it costs. See what I'm saying? To do it nice, like Steve Hiscox lives across the street from me. So if I said, Steve, how much for a vinyl? Because wood doesn't last. A vinyl is 20000 I already so, guessed. So there would be a... It's out for like 30 feet. What, what the planning commission would be establishing is a minimum that Linda Drake has to meet. Yeah, so this would be like a minimum if you want to do if you want to do like a better fence or a fence right, that. Right, but I'm saying you could do that without my pocket. It wouldn't be an issue. 
with the right. board and all that. Yeah, no, no, we, we wouldn't bind you to a specific okay, fence type. We're, we're just you. establishing a floor, yep. and then you can. It, it's up. Yeah, it would be up to you guys. But then once you kind of the understanding is once you figure out the specific dimensions, you come back next month okay. and we'll move from there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is a rule. We can't go higher than the six can't exceed, feet. You can't exceed seven feet. Yeah. But once you get a six with a post, it becomes seven. Is that right? Right. So you can't exceed seven feet. It just can't be higher than seven. Okay. Correct. Okay. All right. Shall we move on? Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, so uh, I'll have a, I guess I'll entertain a motion to table this application to the next month meeting. So moved. Second. Um, motion made by De Commissioner Maskin, seconded by Commissioner Stanton. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, could you please call the roll? Chair Lappin? Yes. Commissioner Maskin? Yes. Commissioner Stanton? Yes. Commissioner Digan? Yes. Commissioner Marino? Yes. No, yes. yes. thank you, Stephen, for cutting through. I get. I was getting stuck on the specific dimensions. You know. Anyway. Yeah, it is. Appreciate that. All right. Okay. So now, um, does everybody you know, need a break, or do you want to just keep moving through? Okay. All right. So um, next on the agenda, we'll ask for quiet in the chamber, please. Thank you. Um, Next on the agenda, representatives from Hawk Hill Solar. Um, I believe we have Mr. Hall and Ms. Sheps here. Uh, so you have a safe trip from Boston? Yes. It's kind of crazy weather for such a long drive. So where we are, uh, I want to give a brief update on where we are in the review process. We have um, engaged in a very lengthy public comment period or through a series of public hearings. We've received multiple written comments, multiple oral comments. We've reviewed the project material. We've reviewed the you know, applicant's concern. I mean, these uh, petitioner's concerns, we've gone through all the applicant application files and we've arrived at the point where we would make a seeker determination. Um, because this action was in t classified as a type one action, meaning an action that might have a significant impact on the environment, we were compelled to do a more thorough review of the environmental impact of the project um, we, we started that last month by completing part two of a full environmental assessment form, um, which is the first part of the Planning Commission's responsibility under Seeker. And now, and then we will be embarking upon part three. Part three of the um, full environmental assessment form requires the Commission as lead agency to embark upon a very thorough fact finding mission about the project's anticipated environmental impacts. We have to uh, thoroughly take a hard, I guess take a hard look at every potential issue and issue a, a determination that is supported by reason and fact. Right? Yeah. Okay. And then um, the courts have held that we don't have to be experts on every little detail of a particular project, but as long as we use our professional judgment and take done our best to do our due diligence, the courts have long upheld these types of rulings. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, so. I guess we'll start by asking if the commissioners have any questions for the representatives from Nexamp and Hartwick, or are we ready to move through to part three? Ready to move to part three? Okay. Yep. So um, you'll see we have a, before us um, a document which was drafted, I guess, by me, um, and we shared it with Stephen. Um, but just to make sure that everything is done in the open, this is the first time this document was distributed to other commissioners. I did send, I guess the second time, I did send it to Commissioner Diagon for review too, um, but we're, we didn't discuss it you know, in, um, not, I guess, outside of public. So we wanted to have, this is the first chance we've had it as a group to fully discuss this document. So there was no discussion going back and forth, no revisions, no nothing. We basically just shared it and the reason we wanted to do this was to have a discussion of this document done and open to provide the maximum amount of transparency related to this review. Um, so we have before us a, a seeker uh, determination. Um, this is a negative uh, declaration, meaning that we find um, this project to have um, a small impact on the environment that is fully mitigated by the actions undertaken by the applicant. 
uh, we reviewed in, in the record. Our decision rests on about 33 separate documents. They're listed here, I and mean, we can read them. But um, and we really um, did quite a bit of work analyzing all the various issues. I can kind of go through. Maybe we should just go through each one. I could summarize, or we could read it. Whatever your preference is. What do you think? Should I just? Because um, this will be made. This, this will be made public. Okay, so we can basically start. I'll just I'll go through the high points. We described the project and its actions. That's been done, you know, quite extensively. Um, we looked at uh, the impacts on um, land. And really, this the site is largely disturbed already um, by prior construction activities on strawberry fields. There were um, there is a decent percentage of the project located on slopes greater uh, than 15 percent, but the erosion and grading, I guess, erosion and sediment control plan prepared by the applicant, in addition to the provisions in the stormwater pollution prevention plan, fully um, address any potential concerns with regard to. Um, impacts from erosion. The site, as per the decommissioning plan and landscaping plan, will be reseeded and restored to pre-project conditions. By actually being fully planted, it will actually be an improvement upon the existing project conditions on the site. So we found that to have no, uh, a minimal impact that is fully mitigated by the actions from the applicant. Um, impacts on soils and geology. There's very little excavation associated with the proposed project. M really, the only excavation has to do with the construction of the access road. We did hear about the um, presence of glacial striations, but we, you know, over the last few months, we haven't received any input from that uh, professor. Yeah, sure. Is it, a, is it appropriate yeah. to pause now? On yeah. That? No. I just want to say generally, this document is amazing. Um, thank you for going through it. That is the one section where I think we maybe have an open end, only because it seems like. We haven't actually received any comments from this professor, any written, or he hasn't attended a meeting, and it just seems like, it just seems like we haven't closed this particular chapter. Yeah, I mean, I think my thought is they're all over the place in that area, and as you said at a previous meeting, I think, right, and right. and that we've given him, and we've, I've emailed him, uh, Steve, Stephen nearly has emailed him, we've given him ample opportunity. Well, so did, I, I advised him to attend the meeting. Yeah. He didn't respond, so it's the kind of the same thing. So we can't just rely on a generalized right. statement. It has to be a specific statement provided, sub, you know, substantiated by clear evidence right. pointing to a particular right. issue. So, yeah, you know, based on his criteria, we'd assume that he knows, but unless he provides the actual proof, we can't. It's something that we can't. Really no, I think you did a good. I think this is a good summation. I just wanted to make sure we talked about it. Yeah, in the open. I appreciate that. So, so we did. We did reference that in the negative declaration, actually. Um, and we assume that because with all the practices that the applicant uh, you know proposes to undertake and this is a stamp plan that is you know has a you know significant ethical obligation to kind of follow through with the provisions outlined in it um, we assume based on if all those mitigation measures are implemented there'll be no impact on um, uh, soils or superficial geology um, the impact on surface water um, we the basically the stormwater pollution prevention plan requires there to be no net increase in runoff coming from the project site um, and this is important because the susquehanna river is an uh, impaired water body under the section clean water act section 303d um, the um, the implementation of all the full all the provisions in the swip will actually result in a net decrease from in runoff coming off the project site um, and so while there is already um, runoff coming off the site, the project will actually improve site conditions by lowering the overall amount of runoff coming off. The stormwater calculations were based upon a, a, a model that is used throughout the country. It was also used on state-specific guidance from the DEC with regard to the runoff potential of solar panels. The DEC has studied that extensively over many years, have been involved in several projects where they've gone over this ad nauseum. They have a technical memo that was in the application package. And so we reviewed that as well and found that um, there will be limited, imp if no impact on surface water. In fact, there will be a net decrease um, in um, uh, runoff coming off the project site. Um, 
We looked at impact on groundwater. Since this project doesn't really involve the construction of a well or withdrawal of groundwater resources, we found that there'd be basically no impact on groundwater as a result of the proposed project. The water table is relatively high, but again, the excavation depth is very low, is very shallow, so it's, we find that to be a negligible impact. The impact on flooding, um, we did, um, take a very hard look at this. We, that's kind of where we touched on stormwater. The applicant has designed its stormwater control measures to be able to sustain the runoff volumes from a 100 year storm. And that's something that is not typically done. Usually it's 10 years, but in the, in the case of this particular application, it's the stormwater features were designed to um, control runoff from a 100 year storm. We again relied on the technical memorandum from the DEC regarding runoff from um, storm, I guess, solar panels. Um, and there will be a qualified inspector that the residents can call that, you know, um, the number will be provided correct for that. So that in the case that a stormwater control feature fails, there'll be a person dedicated to making sure that each part of the stormwater pollution plan is implemented and all the mitigation measures are working. So if something were to fail, that's the number you would call. And the, and the, um, so a property owner would be responsible for mitigating that issue. Um, we did uh, see that there would be a slight increase in impervious surfaces coming from um, the construction of the access road, but there's a series of drainage swales um, that will catch and retain all the stormwater and run into a catch basin on the back part of the site. So that's not going to be a um, major issue. We received, we did receive, you know, substantial comments outlining concerns with regard to um, the stormwater runoff. However, there was no quantitative analysis um, demonstrating problems or disagreements with the analysis done by Labella Associates. And as a commission, we can only rely on, you know, that type of analysis done like a professional study, uh, quantitative analysis, something with clear, um, that points a clear hole in the analysis done by an applicant. So in this case, a lot of the comments regarding runoff were general. I acknowledge and I understand that there's issues, but when the numbers presented by the applicant are, you know, aren't challenged in, in that way, it makes it very difficult to assert that their analysis is incorrect or that would be a significant environmental impact. What, we're not what going. Infor, are you, what information back just a few minutes ago when you said when their water comes to a neighbor's and they call in and they have to handle it. Correct. So if there is a if, it, if there is an issue with not with the neighbor, so there's an if there's an issue with the one of the uh, construction or operation of the property, there will be a number for a qualified inspector that's in the stormwater pollution prevention plan. That's the number that would be called if it's something on the property owner's parcel that is um, broken or fails. The the property owner, not you, but okay. so in the case the applicant would be responsible for dealing with that. I, I have a question. You said there's going to be a number. Is it going to be posted somewhere? Because everybody's going to forget about so it. So that's in the, so that was something that we asked to be updated in the SWIP. Is yeah, the, the way that the SWIP, the stormwater plan that's approved, that's been designed and that will be approved and approved by the state will be uh, posted um, that will have the phone number. There will be a, um, an inspector who will be on site that will be doing weekly inspections and that person is going to be the one checking to make sure the integrity of all of the, the construction activities are happening and that will be one of the three numbers. The owner and the applicant will also be numbers there. Um, I think it, again, this would be the what you would agree to in terms of what you post on the site, but the that stormwater manual by state law has to be there on the site, and it will either be in a field trailer or in a box at the entrance of, of the so, construction site. So there'll be a way, there'll be recourse for the neighbors, is just yes. to cut, you know, cut to the chase. Yes. So that's kind of what we what we found as well, um, and so. Therefore, you know, we did see that there, you know, due to the site conditions and um, concern over stormwater, there is a, you know, minor impact, but the marginal increase in impact from the proposed project has been fully mitigated. Therefore, we find that impacts on flooding will be less than significant. Uh, the impacts on air, there's really, um, 
no impact on air quality. In fact, you know, if we think about the ruling of Massachusetts versus EPA, um, you know, if we talk about carbon dioxide as a pollutant, then actually the project will have a net benefit to air quality by, by the fact of reducing fossil fuel emissions. So there's really not too much to discuss there. Um, the impacts on plants and animals, um, you know, that the hard, the kind of the current built nature, the natural environment in that area is already fragmented due to the developed characteristics of the city of Oneonta, basically. But the applicant has proposed to create a fencing structure that still allows the movement of animals. So there's no real issue with habitat fragmentation. Um, there is milkweed on the, on the project site, but I believe that a pollinator friendly mix of seeding will go to provide a habitat for pollinators who would normally rely on that, I guess, um, milkweed on that site. So there's really no substantial impact to plants or animals, and not to mention that there's no threatened or endangered species on the project site. Um, impacts on agricultural resource, that's really self-explanatory. I don't think I need to go into that. Uh, but if, just to summarize, there's no protected ag district on the project site. There's, the site's not currently used for ag, therefore there's no impact on ag. Impact on aesthetic um, resources. Again, this is another area that we spent quite a bit of time reviewing. The city, the short, you know, kind of the summarized version is the city doesn't have an officially designated scenic vista or scenic viewshed overlay as part of its zoning code that hasn't been established. There's no state recognized scenic viewshed that will be adversely impacted. Um, really, the concentrated impact will be on the neighbors uh, directly along Suncrest Terrace. The applicant has revised their application numerous times to address issues with visual impact. Uh, they've been more than accommodating. They've in fact gone much farther than what is required in terms of screening from, based on our zoning code and in terms of setbacks and, uh, and other types of measures. The, it should be said that our zoning code doesn't really address solar development, but based on what could go in there, um, it's actually much, um, much more accommodating of the neighbor's concern. Um, and so the, um, it's, it's worth mentioning the required setbacks in the zone. The front setback in that zone is 25 feet. The side setback is 40 feet and the rear setback is 40 feet. In this case, the applicant exceeds it by orders of magnitude. Um, they had a staggered, um, you know, they, they provided a line of sight analysis, which again gives us a quantitative base on which to evaluate the visual impacts from the proposed project. Um, we did note that several commenters did provide objections regarding the visual impacts of the project. However, um, according to the ruling of Ramico Ramapo Pinnacle Properties versus the Village of Altamont's Planning Board, generalized objections like this project will destroy my view. I can see it, therefore it's bad. Those kind of statements are not um, enough to base our secret determination on that. If the applicant were to sue, our decision would be overturned. Um, and so that's happened many, many times in different courts throughout the state. Um, we did note we had one commenter do their own visual analysis showing a um, stand of spruce trees that might be dying along Sun Ten Suncrest Terrace, um, and that uh, that based on the uh, landscaping plan and the civil sets, um, that was kind of an area where the applicant relied on natural screening to protect that. Um, we found that that site that area should be um, reinvestigated to make sure that that stand of spruce is in fact in healthy condition. Um, you know, if it were to die, then that part of the um, visual screen would be kind of open, I guess. Um, but that impact is again minor and localized, and can be addressed by the site, you know, in the site plan review, and therefore it won't require the preparation of a de uh, draft environmental impact statement. So, the visual impact kind of analysis is much more in depth. It's a lot longer, which you, you can read. You know, it will be available to the public on the website. Correct? Yes. Okay. Um, the impact on historical and archaeological resources. SHPO reviewed the um, project site and found that there was no impact to any uh, registered uh, historic or archaeological resources. So therefore, there's going to be no impact as to um, associated with historic, I guess, historic properties or archaeological properties as a result of project construction. Uh, the impact on open space and recreation. Um, Currently, Hartwick College allows residents to access strawberry fields on a permit basis. That could change. It's their prerogative as a private property owner to decide that. But since early 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I believe the college has suspended public access to the um, uh, to you know to the campus basically because of COVID protocols. So that so. 
Uh, the project site is anticipated to occupy a large portion of strawberry fields, taking away trails that are already currently used by the public or were used by the public prior to the COVID-19 pan pandemic. The applicant and Hartwick have, have committed to working together to create a new trail system, or I guess trail connector, that will connect Hartwick College campus with the uh, Oneonta Job Corps Academy trail system along the side of the property. That's correct, right? You, it's in the... Yeah, it's in, yeah, so I'm just, I'm just verifying. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um, they've already proposed to do that. Um, you know, it's the there's going to be a temporary impact on open space due to project construction, just because that site is going to be, you know, be, the solar panel is going to be uh, be built, and it'll take some time to get the trail system set up. But those impacts are minor and temporary, and fully in, uh, are mitigated by the applicant. It should be noted that long term, the site, the all the panels will be taken down. The site will be restored to pre-construction conditions, and ostensibly the trail system could be restored to its former glory. Uh, once the project is completed. Um, the impact on critical environmental areas, um, there's no critical environmental area designated in Otsego County, so that's not really an issue. Um, the impact on transportation, uh, the proposed you know, action, it's not likely to create a lot of a substantial traffic impact on Suncrest, but there will be disruptions due to the you know, ingress and egress of construction vehicles. The applicant has committed to working with the neighbors to create a proper schedule to avoid disturbing people and to coordinate times in which the construction vehicles will be coming in. And so we trust that the applicant will have a sustained and open communication with the property owners to make sure that um, their, you know, the construction impact is minimized. But overall, in terms of a seeker analysis, the impacts are minor and will be temporary so therefore it won't require the preparation of a deis um, impact on energy um, we found that you know according to the solar energy industry association one megawatt of solar can provide enough electricity for 164 homes we find you know basically solar energy helps offset fossil fuel demands and will likely have a positive impact on um, uh, you know, uh, climate change and is consistent with adopted city and state policies and county policies regarding renewable energy. So we find that it actually have a positive impact on energy. Uh, the impact on noise, odor, and light. Um, so uh, we find that the proposed project will um, not will create, I guess, site conditions that will not create noise, odor, or other issues that exceed established limits under the existing city code. Um, the inverters have been, the project's been modified to have the inverters be located as far away from sensitive receptors as possible. And, you know, even, you know, to, I guess um, during site plan, we can talk about the inverters, but what we found is that the current distance was not enough to require the preparation of a draft environmental impact statement. Uh, the noise, um, the impacts related to construction op and operation of the project site are again below established levels thresholds in the city and therefore those um, project construction with regard and I guess I guess the overall project impact on noise odor and light will not require the preparation of a draft environmental impact statement Excuse me. Uh, we're going to keep continuing we, you know we've afforded you an ample opportunity to comment so we'll just continue thank you so the impact on human health um, the proposed project involves the construction of a sol you know a solar rain related infrastructure it doesn't involve the handling of hazardous materials and it's not located on a site that has been remediated in the past or is in need of remediation um, in terms of consistency with the community plans this is again an issue that was a sticking point for us that we'll discuss that is kind of, of in should be of interest to nexam um, the project overall is consistent with the uh, city and state and county adopted plans regarding energy but um, where we where had a hold up a last meeting, if you'll recall, was the discussion about the prior ZBA determination regarding solar as an accessory use to um, the principal use of Hartwood College's campus. Um, we reviewed the written record and, and the Zoning Board of Appeals failed to issue a written documentation of how they arrived at the approval of that use variance and how they determined that whether or not that use of a solar array complied with the city of Oneonta zoning code. There was no, they said that we approve the project, but they didn't say why they approved the project. They didn't say how it complied with the zoning law what, or what the issues were. Uh, we looked through pre email correspondence. The email correspondence did say that they found the project to be an accessory use 
to the principal use, and that's what we relied on. We feel comfortable with that um, component initially um, because under you know previous court cases, the Zoning Board of Appeals may not ignore prior precedent when reviewing a project with a similar you know, set of facts, a substantially similar set of facts. They can overrule their, I guess, their prior precedent. They can divorce themselves from that if, but they have to submit a written finding statement demonstrating clear differences and errors within their previous determination. So when they said that, for example, they said that the um, solar array on Corning site which is also a grid-tied solar system intended to serve mainly a, you know, Corning. Um, they would have to come up with a statement, I guess, findings of fact showing that how Nextamp's project is substantially different from that one. That the facts underlying the two are different. Um, and so, while we, as a commission, last month found, you know, the facts to be substantially similar, and we want to compel the zoning board to verify that finding. Um, and so um, we will probably, during site plan, I guess we'll discuss referring the project back to the ZBA for an interpretation of the code. We ask that that interpretation is made in writing because prior practice of the ZBA was to not do that and that makes the ability of our commission constrained because we fear, you know, uh, the risk of legal challenge. We want to ensure as thorough review as possible so it's likely that you know, so that's kind of what I had written in that part of the um, negative declaration. Um, under the uh, consistency with community character, um, we found that the project, you know, substantially exceeds the minimum setback requirements, is substantially screened from public view, and it's sited on previously disturbed land. Uh, the project itself is a much less intense use than what could normally be allowed there. The Hartwick could ostensibly build uh, a brand new football stadium on that site, like a whole like mega football stadium that would be allowed. Is that correct, Stephen? Is the college use? Yeah, there, there's a whole list of accessory yeah. and permitted. So they could build a brand new dormitory facility with all the attendant structures. They could have huge lights. The, the dorms could be 10 stories tall. Um, and so we found that in terms of the intensity of use, we found that to be consistent with the existing neighborhood provided the screening measures and fencing measures undertaken by the applicant. Um, we did receive multiple comments about um, property values. We can, well, you know, Seeker does allow us to look at the impacts on community character in a broad sense. They don't allow us um, to um, rely on, um, I guess, speculative environmental law, such as concern for property values because that's not an environmental factor under Seeker, that's an economic factor that should be undertaken by the council. And so when we're talking about zoning or other sorts of issues, when we're depriving people of their property values, the common council is the body that should be addressing those issues, not this commission and not certainly not under a Seeker review process. And the specific ruling which we relied on was Bell Atlantic Mobile of Rochester LP versus a town of Irondequoit. I can't, I'm not pronouncing that right. Rondequoit. yeah. Um, and that was in 2012. Um, so based on those reasons, we find that the uh, project will not result in any significant adverse environmental impact, and a draft environmental impact statement will not be prepared, no need to be prepared, I should say. The, um, the uh, negative declaration will be made available online if it's approved by this commission tonight. So I'll open the floor for discussion. Sorry, that was, it was a lot longer. It was about like 10 pages, single space. So I tried to. Well, that was long there. enough. Yeah. Um, the gentleman over here uh, brought up the issue that he thought the inverter might make noise. Right. We addressed that last meeting, and it seemed like the, the, they were far enough away that they wouldn't make noise. It was something like 65 decibels. Yeah, so, they. Uh, what do we say? What do we say to them? So my, the other side is that I believe Mr. Hall had indicated that the noise would tra also have to travel through a solid surface to reach the sensitive receptors, basically, too. The gentleman who spoke did refer to two inverters, and uh, I'll do this hopefully so everybody can, can see it. Yeah, just get the easel, if that helps. This is the Suncrest Terrace 
properties are here. The roadway comes around the back. There's one inverter here, which the gentleman spoke about, that is on the back side. He is correct that there's another one, um, uh, say about halfway onto the road, that is on the crest and with regard to the topography is on the same side as the Sunset Terrace. So this, this one is what I would say uh, is on the same face of the hill that, that the properties are on. So I believe that this is the one that he's specifically okay. talking about. Yes. It is still upwards of a thousand feet away and again, I, uh, Liza can talk about the, the specifics of the sound of that decibel. But as we, what I did mention last time is that in traveling that it's a it's a the function of the sound is a square so something that's you know travels whatever the sound is 10 feet away 20 feet away it's a quarter of that it, so it, it so it's basic. further and further you get away from it it's an exponential decrease so it's an exponential decrease so Correct. by then you know a sound of 65 decibels if we were to you know take a measurement at the property at the property edge i guess of mr baker's property then that it would read, you know, less than yes. significant. I, I think the best way to characterize it, and then again, I'll, I'll turn it over to Liza, would be is that one is that this is only going to function, it's only, it, it's to convert the power from the panels into the grid. So it's only going to be functioning while the panels are operating. So it's not a 24 hour day operation. It's only during those times where it's going to be open or, or operating. And yet it's not going to be zero, but it will be part and would blend into the background noise that would be around. Uh, and um, again, I would defer to you, Liza. Right, this is a slide that's been presented. Um, it is in the packet that I've um, provided and I could pull it up on my computer with for a bigger screen. We actually um, circled the two inverters in a red circle. It is not 65, it's 73 decibels of noise, which is comparable to an alarm clock, vacuum, or loud talking, and it's mitigated over 200 feet, which is why we provided 200 foot um, radius circles. So, so that's, and we were placed, they were placed well far enough so away that, so to be completely mitigated before any property lines. Also, the other item that we had to take into account when placing them was um, the fire truck access. So then that we're, that we're gonna probably touch on that in site plan. Mm -hmm. um, so. That, that, that's not, I'm sorry. We hear people talking on the field, which is farther up than these diverters. They, they talk, we can hear the talking. What we're, what we're asking for is we're asking for you to reassess where these are positioned, th this one, and the back side, like the other one is on the other side. That's all we were asking for. So and, we, and it shouldn't be anything that's costly or unreasonable or whatever. Mitigating the sound and not hearing blocking the sound completely are two different things. That's, that's, so that's not accurate. All we're saying is, hey, if you're gonna put the, put the, convert, the, the inverter there, Put it up at the top. You've got plenty of rooms here. You've got plenty of spaces that it could be put. All right, All right Mr. Baker, thank you. We appreciate your comments. We've noted we have, I have all have taken down your comments. You know, at every meeting you've attended, we appreciate them. But, you know, we're going to continue moving forward. Uh, we feel like you've been quite accommodating of your concerns. So I'll give you my opinion. Sure. I think it's the, the solar company is reasonable. 73 isn't that loud, and it drops three decibels every double. So uh, I don't think it's going to, nobody knows <laughs> exactly intuitive, uh, subjectively how it's going to be, but in my opinion, it's not going to be a, a noisy thing. So the, yeah. the, the, other, the other side of that piece is that we look at the established noise thresholds, established, you know, put in the city code. Um, we also questioned, you know, the applicant numerous times over this issue. They've received multiple public comments. There's been, uh, you know, every, you know, technically, you know, if we don't have to have a public hearing with regard to um, a, pr a project unless a draft environmental impact statement is required. So we've given many, many chances for to provide that kind of substantive analysis. Um, as far as noise goes, 
based on what the record that we reviewed, we find that the impact will be less than significant. So yeah. the again, when we look at a, an, an impact with a quantitative component, such as decibel levels or stormwater runoff volumes or traffic or impacts to soil, you know, erosion or anything that can be measured, we need that kind of quantitative analysis in the record to make a determination. If somebody were, if any, if somebody were to say something, it has to be substantiated by um, fact and analysis. And we believe that the analysis completed by the applicant has been thorough. It's fair. Um, if there's an issue with noise, that can be a city code enforcement issue that the city can address as well. Um, are there any other questions or comments about the secret determination? If there are none. Or do we feel comfortable approving the secret determination as presented? Yes. I'll make a motion. Okay. Motion made by Commissioner Maskin to issue the negative declaration as presented uh, under seeker. Uh, do you have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Stanton. Um, any further discussion? Clerk, could you please call the roll? Chair Lappin? Yes. Commissioner Maskin? Yes. Commissioner Stanton? Yes. Commissioner Dygan? Yes. Commissioner Marino. Uh, I'm actually going to abstain from voting on this project just because of my role with the IDA and because the next AMP has approached the IDA for a pilot, so I will be abstaining from this. Project. I appreciate your transparency and openness. Thank you. Passes. Okay, thank you. So now, so now we've had the secret determination, and now we can move on to site plan. And typically, um, for projects that are controversial or high profile in the city, um, we like to do a site plan approval via resolution. So I prepared a resolution that should be in front of you. It's quite long um, as well. So I think it's about, this one's about seven pages, single spaced or so, but. Double sided. Double sided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, double, it's based seven total pages, like three sheets, four sheets of paper double-sided um, and so I can I don't um, before we start there's like you know a list of again 33 topics that we reviewed as part of the record I can, should, can I just abstain from reading all 33 I'll just but I'll start with the kind of the resolution and then I'll summarize what was discussed um, and kind of our reasoning behind our site plan approval okay so um, Basically, it states resolution number one of 2021, approving um, with conditions a site plan for five megawatt AC solar array and related infrastructure on Suncrest Terrace for tax parcel 287116-1-1.1. I believe you also have to, get, your project's allowed as of right in the town, so they don't require site plan approval, right? In the town? Of Oneonta. Sorry, Do you require that? site plan approval in the town of Oneonta? Uh, we are just for due diligence, yeah. um, okay. which we've been in uh, communication with them and we'll be seeing them early October. Okay, great. So it says, whereas Hawk Hill LLC, located at 101 Summer Street, Boston, Massachusetts, also known as the here and after known as the applicant, has applied for site plan approval to construct a five megawatt alternating current or AC for short solar array to be installed on 26 acres of a 124 acre site owned by Hartwick College on Suncrest Terrace. And whereas a full EAF date, we can revise that. Um, so whereas the um, city of only, I guess the, ha sorry, Hawk Hill LLC has prepared a full environmental assessment form dated April 30, 2021. And that's been submitted along with the completed site plan review application. Um, the city, whereas the City of Oneonta Planning Commission has thoroughly reviewed the following supporting documents submitted by the applicant, the City of Oneonta staff and other interested parties. And there's a list of 33 separate materials that we reviewed. Um, whereas the applicant um, presented the project to the City of Oneonta Planning Commission on May 19. And whereas the City of Oneonta Planning Commission prepared and distributed a notice of intent to serve as lead agency as per the requirements of the uh, seeker during its May 19, 2021 meeting, and whereas the city of Oneonta established a public comment period between May 19, 2021 and June 9, 2021 for members of the public to discuss their concerns 
related to the proposed project and whereas the Otsego County Planning Department issued a notice dated June 3rd, 2021, having reviewed the proposed project under General Municipal Law Section 239-M and referred the project to the City of Oneonta for local action and whereas the City of Oneonta Planning Commission having received no objections to intent, its intent to serve as lead agency, classified the project as a type one action during its June 16, 2021 meeting. And whereas the applicant submitted a line of sight analysis showing visual impacts of the proposed project from three separate properties on Suncrest Terrace. And whereas the applicant submitted a decommissioning plan and operations and maintenance <coughs> plan, updated civil drawings and a landscaping plan to the city of Oneana Planning Commission on August 18, 2021. And whereas the City of Oneana Planning Commission reviewed and found adequate the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan, or SWIP, prepared by Labella Associates, dated April 30, 2021. And whereas the City of Oneana Planning Commission completed Part 2 of the FEAF during the August 18, 2021 meeting. And whereas the City of Oneonta Planning Commission has given due consideration to all public comments submitted on the record related to the project file. And whereas the City of Oneana Planning Commission considers the application complete um, in and in conformance with the City of Oneonta Zoning Code sections 300-13, 300-92, 300-100, and 300-101, pending additional review by the City of Oneonta Zoning and Housing Board of Appeals. And whereas the City of Oneonta Planning Commission relied on a November 26, 2018 decision from the City of Oneonta ZBA determining a grid tied solar array was an accessory use so long as a majority of electricity generated served the principal use of the parcel and whereas because there was no written do record documenting the grounds for the decision the city of Oneon the planning commission has no choice but to refer the proposed project to the ZBA for an interpretation of the proposed project's compliance with the city of Oneon to zoning code and pursuant to seeker and its implementing regulations the Planning Commission issued a negative declaration of environmental significance after having reviewed and, find, uh, and accepted the, as adequate the full environmental assessment form parts one, two, and three. And whereas the City of Oneonta Planning Commission has reviewed um, this application relative to the considerations and standards found in the City of Oneonta Zoning Code section 300-75 um, subpart C. Okay. Um, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Planning Commission approves a site plan submitted April 30, 2021 and its supporting materials presented above with the following conditions. The proposed project is referred back to the City of Oneonta Zoning Board of Appeals to evaluate whether the proposed project meets the requirements to be established as an accessory use in the university zone and the applicant um, amends its um, landscaping plan to provide adequate vegetative screening for 10 Suncrest Terrace to the greatest extent practicable and economically feasible. Um, and so we also have a written decision of site plan approval outlining our reasoning, which I can summarize too, just to move things along. Sure. Okay, so we find that the proposed use is compatible with the surrounding built environment with respect to spacing, height, size, and architectural design, um, and compatibility of the building lighting and signs. The proposed project exceeds the setback requirements and it's located in a previously disturbed area and is a much less intense use than what normally would be allowed there. The arrangement of vehicular traffic and uh, access and circulation for the proposed project is adequate. They've complied with, the, complied with the provisions established by the city engineer and now city administrator Greg Matthijs um, in his June, 2020, June 24, 2021 correspondence outlining the fact that the applicant would have to upgrade its roads to meet uh, city specifications and maintain clearance for ve emergency vehicles. Uh, we find that the arrangement for pedestrian circulation for the proposed use is adequate. It's going, the site's basically going to be fenced. The existing, the trail system will be rerouted to allow the public to still have that connection between Hartwood College and the Job Corps Academy. So therefore, pedestrian you know, we find that the pedestrian circulation for the project site is adequate. Um, the proposed project will not really require a lot of parking. Um, unlike some of our housing projects in the city. Um, so therefore there's really no issue with parking aside from the temporary parking related to construction vehicles and the inspector's vehicles when they come and check out the project site after you know pre and post construction. Uh, the stormwater drainage facilities for, for the proposed use satisfy um, the requirements established by the DEC's general permit for stormwater discharge. I think the permit number is GP-0-20-001 
um, the applicants taken into consideration the, the DEC's memo regarding solar arrays with regard to their runoff potential and has provided adequate stormwater controls to ensure that there's no net increase in runoff coming off the project site. And in fact, there's a, a net decrease um, in the project site. The qualified inspector will evaluate the installation of all stormwater practices. And um, therefore, we find that the project site will not adversely contribute to erosion, ponding, flooding on or off site. We really, again, when we make this finding, we really stress the fact that if there is an issue, the neighbors can easily find the, the number. And that if there, and an issue does happen, that the issue is corrected and mitigated fully, and that any sort of potential damage to properties are, are addressed at that time. So that's kind of a point that I would, that's not in here, but I'd like to emphasize based on the public's concern. So that we find that the proposed project will not require a connection to the city of Oneonta's public water and sewer system itself. Um, we find that the applicant has made a substantial effort, effort to mitigate the visual impacts related to the proposed project. We kind of out, we addressed that in the negative declaration. Do you feel like I need to go through it again? No? Okay. So we did, with a, one of the conditions of site plan approval was to investigate 10 Suncrest Terrace with regard to the stand of spruce. So we request that the applicant do that as a condition of site plan approval. So they did highlight specifically in correspondence submitted to this commission where it is. And so if you feel that the vegetative screening is adequate, that should be okay, but that is one of the conditions of um, the approval. The proposed project is not um, an apartment complex or townhouse or condo. Therefore, you know, that, that particular provision of the zone of the site plan review law doesn't really apply to this project. The applicant submitted a detailed landscaping plan um, and we feel that they really won't have a, um, a major kind of issue with community character, uh, just you know, for all the reasons we identify in the negative declaration. The applicant is committed to designing the access road to mid ingress, ingress and egress requirements for emergency vehicles. Um, the portion of strawberry uh, field not covered by the solar array could probably be used as a staging area for emergency vehicles. And one point of thing that I wanted to verify was that you didn't really have any issues with the emergency access. There was one question that I had about access to fire hydrants on the project sites of an event that there was a fire. Is that, would that be able to be, did, did the um, fire department feel that they could, um, you know, put it out? There, there, are, there are some up there. Thank you. They're not high up. They're on, they'd be on the Suncrest Terrace side of the road, but there are a couple of plugs up there. Oh, thank you. We have correspondence with the um, assistant fire chief who um, approved our plan as is. And that, and for the record, so I'll prob we'll probably have revised that piece. So when was that correspondence dated? Uh, June, Monday, June 14th. Monday, okay. Can, can you send that over to the clerk, please? Thank you. Okay, so we'll make note of that revision. Um, we, um, again, we did recognize several commenters expressed concern about the existing runoff on the project site and the potential increases of stormwater runoff as a result of project construction. Um, again, um, we recognize that there is an issue, but we rely again on the applicant's uh, stormwater pollution prevention plan that shows that net runoff from the project site will reduce, will be less than the existing site conditions. There was no other quantitative analysis that refuted that point. Um, we believe that there will be, there's ample safeguards to ensure that all the mitigation measures will be fully implemented and inspected. There's recourse for the neighbors if it's not, so we believe that that will not be an issue. Um, the proposed project greatly exceeds the minimum setback requirements by orders of magnitude, and again, just to put it into perspective, if you wanted to meet the minimum setback requirements, you could build like a football stadium 25 feet away from someone's property, basically. Um, and that would be much worse than the proposed project at hand. Uh, the proposed site is located in a previously disturbed parcel um, that is screened um, from Suncrest Terrace by existing vegetation. Um, the applicant, um, there'll be a, um, uh, the applicant has taken due care to, to ensure that the project fit in with the natural and built environment. There's gonna be a minor, minor impact to strawberry fields that is unavoidable 
um, as a result of project construction, but the applicant has mitigated this issue by rerouting the existing trail system around um, the solar um, a solar array. And again, it is Hartwex College is private property, so they are providing the, the trail access as kind of a goodwill effort, gesture to the public. It's not like a state park or anything where they where it's a taxpayer uh, asset. So that's important to keep in mind. Uh, the proposed projects consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and um, state established state and county policies regarding climate change and energy. Uh, and what else? Um, okay. Yeah. So. Um, so we did want to touch on um, the uh, zoning. Um, we find that the project is in compliance with the city of Oni on a zoning code pending the zoning board of appeals verification. So this body, we can recommend that we, you know, say that it's our opinion that the project is an accessory use to Hartwick College based on the facts in front of us, correct? And that we can recommend that they interpret it the same way, which we did, but we want to send it back to them to verify because that's their, our body, we're not an appellate body. They ultimately can interpret the zoning code. So in order to make sure that we ensure full thoroughness in the review, that's where we'll go. Um, and so to kind of, um, again, the Zoning Board of Appeals did find that the project was an accessory use to Corning, that the, sorry, the Corning Solar Array was an accessory use to the Corning facility. We believe that the facts are substantially similar in both cases to warrant, to count this as a prior issue of prior precedent. Um, if you want to look up the prior court rulings that we relied on, so this paragraph I'll just kind of read just to kind of help people understand. So we say that New York law has long held that the Zoning Board of Appeals cannot ignore its prior decisions when faced with an application that was substantially similar to a prior application. So this is the matter of Lucas versus Board of Appeals of the village of Mamaronek. Again, I'm probably butchering that. Mamaronek. thank you. Um, that was second department of uh, appellate division, 2008. In the case of the proposed project, the commission believes that the circumstances of a solar array located on the Corning property in Oneonta Sixth Ward are similar enough to fall into the same care category as the city of Oneonta Zoning Board of Appeals prior interpretation. It should be noted that, that the village of Mamaronek um, case allows the ZBA to provide a rational expl explanation for reaching a different decision with regard to the proposed project. So again, rational, expl re, uh, rational explanation means something in writing, in, in my opinion. So you can't just say, well, you know, we look at it as individuals. And they have to kind of explain um, how the facts of the record and everything else kind of contradict what they previously ruled. It should be noted in the matter of conversions for real estate LLC versus the Z Zoning Board of Appeals, of the uh, incorporated village of Roslyn in 2006, uh, Appellate Division Second, um, Second Department, that it's necessary to establish the prior existence of earlier determinations by the, by the ZBA um, of earlier decisions with factual similarities to the proposed project. So again, um, they can't just ignore prior precedent with regard to a previous project. It's not a one-off, it's actually an established track record of view. It's like a court having a prior ruling on an issue and then ignoring it and making a completely different decision on a subsequent issue. They can't divorce themselves from precedent unless they have a specific clear and clearly outlined reason why they would do so. So therefore, uh, since there's no written determination related to the Corning Solar Project, the commission believes it's prudent to exercise caution and refer the proposed project back to the ZBA for an interpretation of the zoning code with regard to the project's compliance with the code itself. Commissioner Dagan, yes, go ahead. I think you did a great job in explaining our position here. I, I would say my one question is, if our position that this is in compliance um, with our zoning code, then why why do we need to refer to the Zoning Board of Appeals? My, like, we are performing the site plan review, and we have the authority to approve or disapprove that site plan review. That's right. If we determine that this is not in conformance with the code, we would say you need to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and get a variance. But our, it is our opinion that this is yeah so, why so is it necessary that we so we can recommend but we're not i don't think we're given the power to interpret uh the zoning code in that way so therefore but we uh, we do have the ability to review the prior precedent established by the zba 
and we can assume that if they were to follow the long established legal record that they would kind of find the same thing but because they didn't provide a written record of that decision that we could reference and cite if someone were to challenge and say well you're relying on another person's interpretation or Steve Yearley's interpretation of what happened at the meeting and there's no actual document we worry that we're not exercising the maximum amount of due diligence I mean you know so. I guess just you know it's it's their zoning enforcement officer's job to make decisions on whether it is in compliance with the zoning code and if he decides it is not then it goes to the ZBA he's made the decision that it is and therefore referred it to us so, so the easiest answer for that is <clears throat> if this if this application were to be challenged in court having the zoning board provide a written um, a written determination that their prior uh, precedent as far as an interpretation of the zoning code is applicable to all similar type of development we would then add that to the record as part of the review so right now what we have is I understand what happened at the meeting I recognize what the zoning board did at the meeting but we don't have a record a written record showing that that event occurred yeah. After we reviewed the, the, the minutes, there essentially are no minutes. Yeah, there's no, re the recording was deleted. And normally, you know, it's prior practice for the ZBA to actually write down their decisions specifically for this reason, because other commissions and boards use it as a ongoing interpretation of the code. It's like a um, written record of what happened and we are like a law. And so we look at, you know, how they interpreted the law to make our decisions, but in this case, they forgot to write down how okay, they interpreted it. I understand. It. Yeah. The, 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 the essentially what happened is there's there are no minutes. The minutes just say it was approved. Yeah, and that there's makes no our job harder. as to why they actually didn't even include the interpretation. It's literally just an approved application. So logistically speaking, if we were to approve this tonight, the next step would be they have to consider it at their meeting? Yeah, we would, we would recommend approval. We find, you know, we have our, our opinion is, in my opinion, you know, our opinion is pretty clearly stated that we feel that, it, that it's an accessory use. We feel that the project complies with the city zoning code, but that's our opinion and we want the appellate body to verify that. And they, they may not, but if they don't, they have to follow kind of the legal procedures to prove why they don't. And that's kind of outside of our purview, unfortunately, but I do plan on attending that meeting when it does come up. I hope we can prevent this problem in the future. Yeah, that's yeah. We ran into that twice actually today. Today, yeah. Right. Especially from the applicant's standpoint, because that's the route we went to to go down in March. Correct. And in the beginning of April, we received that um, from Stephen. It was super helpful that he discussed our proposal with both the planning commission and the zoning board. It was determined that based on the previous interpretation by the ZBA that this would be an accessory use and the planning commission could approve this through a site plan review process so then that's the direction we followed and then to in september to then go back to the zoning board what does that process look like well i, I would argue that at this point with an approved site plan and seeker complete i mean it's a pretty it's basically a written statement from the zoning board verifying that they're yeah previous interpretation for the same project should be applied per my understanding of what occurred at the meeting and based on what the planning commission has reviewed. Yeah, so they'd, we'd be asking for a verification, so there really wouldn't be a lot of extra work okay. on, on your end. Okay. Is, the, is that even really the applicant petitioning that board, or that's, that's us petitioning that board? So we should be represented there, right, as a, as a commission? Because we, we're the ones... Theoretically, you could. Yeah, we. So that could be a way in which that could be an alternative approach. So we could theoretically petition the ZBA to interpret solar energy systems. You know, with their compliance with the. Um, I'm just trying to be considerate the, to what we've are, what right. we've been through with this. It should, it should be noted that Corning's application was a company called GreenSpark that made their application. So it was, it was the same. It was essentially the same arrangement. It's just that the programmatic nature of the project is a little bit different, but we feel that the facts are real to substantially similar. So in the case of this project, they have the maximum amount of energy going to Hartwick College's campus as the anchor tenant under specific um, program through NYSERDA, is that correct? 
Yes, and the benefits. So to be an accessory use, it has to benefit the principal. The, the and it's and it's, support, and it's subordinate to the principal use. Right, so they're benefiting from the energy credits to the maximum amount allowed by NYSERDA, but then in the few other points outlined by Hartwick's letter as well. Put into the record. Oh, uh, okay. Carrie has that to read into the record, so we'll just read that in right now. So it's a letter from Dr. Margaret Drugovich, president of Hartwood College. Dear Mr. Lapin, thank you for the Planning Commission's diligent review over the last few months of Hartwood College's documentation for our solar project. I understand that the Planning Commission has requested information about the benefits of the project to the college. Please see the list of benefits below. Credit purchase and sale agreement. In addition to the ground lease agreement on December 7, 2020, Hartwood College entered into a credit purchase and sale agreement with Nexamp. Once operating, Nexamp will provide 40% of this project's annual energy credit value to Hartwood College, which is the maximum amount of capacity allowed to any single subscriber as dictated by Nasurda's New York Sun Solar Program. An allocation of this size is expected to provide energy credits equivalent to over 3,500 megawatt hours in the first year alone, or over 67,400 megawatt hour over a 20 year period. This provides Hartwood College with an annual cost savings. Environmental sustainability. This project, solar project aligns with Hartwood College's commitment to sustainability and minimizing our carbon footprint. Hartwood College mission. The educational opportunities the solar system affords the college is an important component of the project. Hartwood College and Nexamp have an educational plan to incorporate the solar system into the curriculum for college classes. Additionally, Nexamp's data acquisition system, or DAS, provided to Hartwood College as part of this project, collects and reports real-time system performance and weather data from the site, giving students, faculty, and Oneana community members access to important information about how the system works, why it works, and how it will meet its estimated performance. Thank you in advance for sharing this information with the Planning Commission. Please let me know if you need any further information. Thank you. So, you know, I think that makes it pretty clear. What is everybody? So now, I guess, we can debate, open the floor for discussion about the conditions of the site plan approval. And then if we change the conditions and we'll revise the resolution, we'll write down the guys the revised criteria and then vote on that, vote on the revisions and then vote on the overall resolution of site plan approval. So does that sound like a fair process? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay, so with regard to um, condition one, which is to refer the project back to the ZBA for a written interpretation of the zoning code um, and whose responsibility that should be. So that's the current, what we're, what we're currently debating right now. So what are people's thoughts? I would prefer it to be our responsibility, but I don't know if that's the proper way to go. Okay. Um, what, uh, what does everybody else think? Sense. Based on what she said before, how they already went that route, it seems like it should be our responsibility or something. Okay. On the um, so we do say we'll refer the proposed project back to the ZBA, but it doesn't specifically say who will do it. So in that case, that could stand with the understanding that the commission will represent. Um, Are we allowed to do that? Is that is there any prior precedent? I mean, that? I think you could argue that it, any any individual or person who's aggrieved by a decision of the zoning enforcement officer has the ability to seek appeal from the zoning board of appeals. We're not we're, we're not necessarily aggrieved by them, but we are. I guess we would be because they're be by determination because their determination be. is preventing us from Correct. engaging in an expeditious review of a, a project application. Actually, it also prevents us from understanding how a growingly popular land use, such as solar, would be treated by the city zoning code. So without a clear interpretation, it makes it very difficult for us to do our job, essentially. Um, and you know, we did do our due diligence ahead of time. So I guess in terms of attending the meeting, I think we can, as long as we're not a quorum, we can have a few attend. So. It, does anybody want to volunteer to attend with me? And then, is it too late to be on their agenda for this month? Yes. Okay, so it'd have to be in October. It would be the October meeting. So who would want to volunteer? When do they usually meet? Last, 
Fourth Wednesday. Fourth Wednesday. So, so we October twenty seventh. October twenty seventh. Do I have a volunteer to attend with me? Okay, Commissioner. Uh, I don't want to take it. If someone else wants to. Anybody else? <laughs> don't everyone <laughs> fight. <laughs> don't don't all volunteer at once. Okay, so Commissioner Dagan and I will attend the October 27th. I'll go with you, too. We can have three, right? Yeah, so Commissioner Stanton will come as well, so we'll go and discuss that at the time. If someone wants to take my spot, I can. Yeah, so <laughs> Steve, no, Steve, we'll need Steve to come. October 27th. Correct. 7 p.m.? 7 o'clock. Okay, and then... I suppose we should, yeah, we should specify. They, they yeah. can come. They can, they can come, too. They, they probably will want to because it affects their project. Um, but we'll be there. We'll probably be discussing that. You know, it's not. It's this thing that per permeates throughout the entire city, but it's something that you know. Improved government coordination and customer service is something that we value very yeah. highly, and so we want to make sure that we address this issue so that it doesn't happen again. I, I understand the want to tie this up. With that said, what does that? look like to refer back to the zoning board what what level is it one one meeting is it I mean, input from the public it, is it it should basically be just the zoning board reviewing the facts of this application yeah so we the we, facts of the previous application it's a substan there's a substantial record already established there's a planning commission opinion to You're not approving the site plan there's no public hearing no there's right. no public hearing it's basically public. them it's basically going to a it meeting is a it, is a it is a public hearing <laughs> all, of, all of the meetings are public hearings essentially the public can come and they can comment in fact you know I you know encourage them to do so um, but they would specifically be focused on that one issue of the project's compliance with the zoning code, um, and again, you know, we have sub you know substantial findings which present our opinion. You know, we can't. I can't say how they'll act as a, as a board. They're separate, but we believe that the you know prior court precedent clearly states that the prior precedent, prior interpretations must be followed if the facts are similar. And if they're not, and, it, and they can, the only way they can divorce from that precedent is with a substantial statement of fact proving otherwise. And so they have to submit. So basically, we would, as part of their packet, they would see the resolution of site plan approval. They would see the negative declaration. They would see the entire application package too. They would see all the public correspondence and comments associated with it. They'd see everything essentially and be able to make their determination. And we can't really dictate how they, since they're the appellate body, they would take it from there but we would make our case and explain our reasoning and then they would discuss amongst themselves and interpret it shouldn't take I don't it's not a lengthy process essentially and the site plan would we'd already decide on the site plan tonight um, as part of the review process yeah I mean it would literally just be a clarification of their previous opinion yeah basically councilman Carson just for my own clarification so Representatives of this commission is going to go before the Zoning Board of Appeals on behalf of this applicant or on behalf of the city. And has this been discussed with the city attorney? Since there is no precedence, I just want to make sure that the city is not going to be at a, at a legal point held liable for this. Yeah, I, I think it's a fair, that's, a, then, that's a good question. I'm also concerned that you're going to apply on behalf of the city, right? You're making an application to go before the ZBA, which you just stated that you're going to give all background references. That's all. To. So all of that is actually the applicant's paperwork, not yours, other than your negative declaration. Well, I think technically all of the, to answer the last, I'll go backwards. So the last question first, all of this material is public record, so it's your material, it's Mr. Hall's material, anybody, any member of the public can have full access to everything that we discussed. That's why we kind of discussed everything in the open and public to make sure that everything would be entered into the record. Um, your point about addressing, uh, consulting the city attorney, I think that's a valid, um, it's a valid question and something that should, probably should be done, but it, the city of Oneon, the how we approve site plans and how we coordinate activities between the ZBA and the Planning Commission is extremely irregular as it is. I don't, I can't think of another municipality in the country or much less the state that does it this way, that has two bodies that can approve site plans and one that can also approve variances. 
Um, it's very, it's, it, it was designed, it's called the Red Tape Express. It's, um, but that's kind of not my body to what, pervy to weigh in on that. But because it's on, because the way that it is, it creates a two headed monster that can interpret the zoning code in different ways. So this is my attempt or our commission's attempt to coordinate our mutual understanding of the code. And I think it, it is wise that we should consult the city attorney to make sure that we can do that and ask for a clarification. But because they did make the ZBA, we could technically not consult the ZBA because we can rely on their prior interpretation of the code. That's technically possible. But because there's no written record of that interpretation existing that substantiates kind of the project's compliance or solar's compliance with the city's zoning code, we feel compelled to make sure that there is a written record. So we're trying to correct and clarify a previous, uh, another component of the record to make sure that there's no legal issue or any sort of ambiguity associated with the code because theoretically, another solar company could come in next month and say, we wanna do the same thing. The same issue with the zoning code is gonna come up then as it would now. And so we wanna head that off and actually have a clear determination and give the city a chance to revise its zoning code to address solar energy systems in the future. Just to really clear that up, we're not representing the applicant. No. We, we're, we're approving this project today saying that, or we're not approving, but just say hypothetically we approve this project. We're, we're representing our own decision. Yeah. yeah, so we're representing the city planning commission. We're asking for a clarification on the zoning code. Right. We're not yeah, so we're not representing the... NextAmp. We're not in they're like an interested party. It's like an interested agency. But for us, for our purposes, we want the ZBA to clarify that component of the zoning code. Is it possible to get the city attorney's opinion on that? Yeah, sure. We can do that. Um, I mean, so, Dave Merzik might say that the Zoning Board of Appeals can just provide that opinion to the Planning Commission. So okay. It might not even require, require an application. So we, It could literally just be theoretically the Planning Commission as part of their review, could request the Zoning Board of Appeals to give them some sort of opinion. I mean, so I can clarify that with Dave Murray. Yeah, so why don't we start That's with the city attorney? Yeah. Let, let's, let's start with the city attorney. Let, we can, I can email him. Mm -hmm. I'll include He's the, out of town at the moment. Well, he'll, he'll answer. Well, I'll include the commission. Well, I'll be asking for, you know, about the procedure associated with an interpretation and we'll ask how we'll talk about frame the issue then we'll ask um you know if we, the zba can just issue us a written opinion and if that's the case and they can just issue us a written opinion we don't even need to go to the meeting they would just write it they would discuss it amongst themselves we'd probably want to be there when they do do that but they would just be able to do that and provide that opinion in writing and that would be part of the record the email asking for clarification since it's the whole commission will be cc'd on that is also part of the public record so i'll you know, see, include everybody so that it's added um, so you can see what I write. I mean, the section in the code addressing interpretations for the Zoning Board of Appeals is on direct appeal from a determination of city code enforcement officer. The Zoning Board of Appeals may hear and decide questions where it is alleged there's an error in any order, requirement, decision, or determination made by the city engineer involving the interpretation of the zoning ordinance. And when it talks about application two, uh, da, 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 da. Appeals to the Zoning Board of Appeals may be taken by any person aggrieved or by an officer, department, board, or bureau of the city. Appeals must be submitted to the city at least three weeks prior to the hearing date. So that's kind of where we're at. So you can appeal for an interpretation. So it's, so it's an aggrieved party, essentially. It could be anybody then. So it could be the city of Oneana. The city planning commission could be the aggrieved party in this case. And if they don't approve it, if they say it's not in compliance, then they would have to get a variance. And do they have to start this process all over again, or is our process done? I mean, secret's been done. Site plan's been approved. I mean, yeah. I mean, then the criteria, for, you know, let's say they deny it, they would have to, again, provide the reason why, based on the facts in front of them, that they are going to divorce from their prior precedent. And then, you know, then in terms of the variance criteria it'd be relatively easy to meet the four, because then in this case, their hardship would not be self-created if they were to get the site plan approved, have a prior precedent which the city went away from, then the, there's, they'd, it'd be relatively easy, in my opinion, to get the variance, theoretically. 
Um, but again, I can't say. Um, that's not my place. So I think, so where we are right now to summarize is the City of Oneana Planning Commission will request a, um, an opinion from our city attorney about the proper procedure to get the zoning code interpreted to address solar energy systems and their compliance with the City of Oneana Zoning Code. The city attorney will then give us our next steps and then we'll move we'll proceed accordingly public meetings will be noticed so that folks can attend and the correspondence will be made available as part of the record Sounds okay good. um so the second condition about the screening at um 10 suncrest what do we want to what do we how do we feel about that So the specific condition I'm referring to is one neighbor did an analysis, like a visual impact analysis show, and compared it to the civil sets, showing that there's a stand of spruce that's going to be used as natural cover. The, the resident claims that the spruce trees are dying, um, but I'm not a, um, I guess, dendrologist, so I don't really know about like tree health, you know, how to You're evaluate that. But, you know, so we requested that the applicant check that, to check that out. If they feel that the spruce trees are adequately healthy, then they would, you know. They also referenced the shrubbery. What if they decide they're not healthy? What are they going to do? We ask that they provide adequate vegetative screening to the greatest extent, practicable and economically feasible. So basically, extend their staggered, you know, screening pattern to, to accommodate that. And so we respond, you know, because of their analysis, we ask that they just take a look. They didn't document you know, again, in absolute terms, the health of that, those spruce trees, but they did provide a, a specific location, so we just asked that the applicant consider looking at it. Have they seen this, the applicant? I have a letter? copy for them. So that, that letter, that correspondence is re referenced in the record outlining our decision. Um, Seems like there's two points they want uh, it's about the uh, spruce and pine, and then the second point is about uh, shrubs being planted on houses around them, but not behind theirs. Yeah, okay. Sorry. So it's shrubs planted on houses yeah. around theirs. It's not specific. Yeah. I'm just going to summarize like you said. Like, so basically, it's just to check that address. The, the health of the trees. Correct. Because the visual impact analysis did that line of sight in that location. Yeah, and but they they assumed that the spruce trees were healthy and that if they weren't and they died, that would change the parameters of that analysis. So essentially, that's kind of the, the issue. And so we asked that that just be checked on. So if the spruce trees are found to be in good condition, then there's no further mitigation measures would be necessary. However, if they're dying and need to be taken out or then they're in danger of being taken out, then that kind of, you know, well, then we just ask that the applicant investigate. They can decide. I think we give latitude to um, determine, what, you know, the level of mitigation, but we just ask that it be done so to the greatest extent practicable and economically feasible. So that basically means that the best, you, you do your best to fix that. And part of this is asking that they don't clear the red the red pine from that address. They so maybe that. so maybe it's so on the condition that we say the specific condition the wording in that it says it amends the applicant amends its landscaping plan to provide adequate vegetative screening for ten Suncrest Terrace to the greatest extent practicable and economically feasible. That's fine. I think, yeah. So I think. Yeah, because I, I focus on spruce, but you're right, there's a lot more to that than spruce trees. Is, is just a curiosity, is Russell and Kim Griswold here? So. They're not. But they did provide that visual impact, their own mini visual impact analysis. Um, and I believe um, there also was one commenter who did ask about site suitability and provided several other sites but again because a draft environmental impact statement is not being required we're not obligated to look at other alternative sites 
However, if a DEIS were required, we would look at project alternatives through the scoping process, et cetera. But that's kind of neither here nor there. But I did just bring that up. So are we comfortable with the conditions outlined for site plan approval? Okay. Are we ready to vote on the yeah. site plan? I understand there's going to be one abstention already. So um, do I have a motion to approve I make a motion site plan approve with site conditions, plan. the following conditions? Do I have a second? Com motion made by Commissioner Stanton, sorry. Do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner uh, Maskin. Um, any further discussion? Thank you for putting this together, Danny. Yes. You're welcome. That was very helpful. Don't thank me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I just want to make sure that everything gets, gets through. So yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll probably see an email tomorrow. I'm probably late tomorrow, around tomorrow evening or so, from, okay. from me about that. Okay. Um, Clerk, could you please call the roll? Chair Lappin? Yes. Commissioner Maskin? Yes. Commissioner Stanton? Yes. Commissioner Dygan? Yes. Commissioner Marino? I'm abstaining. Passes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, there was one um, bit of new business that I wanted to bring up briefly. I know it's already in this 9.30. I don't want to keep you much longer. But the Legislative Committee um, is in the process of reviewing the proposed zoning changes to the MU1, our downtown district. We reviewed that some, a few months back. And now they're starting on the SECA review process and they wanted to ask the Planning Commission to take that on. So I believe in the subsequent months we will be doing so. Okay. Um, the one thing that I will point out is because this is a change to the zoning code, it could be logically anticipated that the city is going to revise its whole zoning code in the future. So I wanted to, for us to think about doing a SECA analysis on a, a full transition of the city zoning code to a transit-based code just to lay the groundwork so that in the event that they say now we're going to take on one other district and they go district by district, they don't have to keep coming back and doing seeker. That's actually illegal because it's segmented. So we want to uh, anticipate the whole scope of the action, so that's kind of why we would do it that way. Does that make sense, Dave? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, oh, before you guys bail, um, before I can send the 239 m to the county, I need someone to fill out the EAF. For the for the ME one code. Okay. So we can yeah. do that. If we're but if we're gonna consider the whole zoning, the whole city, don't they need to present it to us as such? Yeah, so I mean I can't send the two thirty nine M to the county without some sort of BAF form for right. the current section we have. Yeah, so we're starting so in the project description we'll say that the current action is a change to the MU1 zoning code from a Euclidean zoning code to a form-based or transect-based code. It's anticipated that the full scope of the action will include a full transition of the current city zoning code to that style of zoning. So that's what we're now, that's you know what we'd be analyzing. So we'll say that, though we'll just point out that those sections of code hasn't been, um, have not been created yet, but to avoid segmentation, blah, 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 we'll just say that. To avoid segmentation, we're going to consider the whole scope of the action. Okay. Yeah. I, I gotta go. Okay, no, motion to adjourn. No, no move. No, I have one thing I want to bring up. Oh. Um, I, you have a, a make correct address on this. It says that, that the Hog Hill Solar is on Suncrest Terrace. It's not on Suncrest Terrace. It's on the Hartwood Hill or Strawberry Field that, that is Hartwood Hill. Um, so you, you should not be using our street, Suncrest Terrace, as the address for that so, for the Hawk Hill Solar Danny, Farm. I looked up, this is according to the county tax map, I looked up the parcel number, and according to the county, it says that the address is Suncrest Terrace. Yeah, so that's also be the 911 address for the, yeah. the entry. Yeah, so that's what we, that's what we relied on. So we clicked on, I did, I basically went on the county GIS tax map, clicked on the parcel, and it had, and used the address. I also copied the address provided by the applicant. I looked that up after your comment earlier. Um, they continued with the meeting. That's what I was talking back here with Stephen as I was looking it up. We have never, so. ever had, it's always been hardware property. It's not yeah. Suncrest Terrace. It's not on our street at all. Nothing about that hillside above us is on our street. So we just we have the um, specific 
parcel, tax map. We have the website pulled up. The specific tax map according to the uh, Matsigo County, I guess. Yeah. Um, Real property tax service. Yeah. It's not it, says, it says Suncrest. What the county has done. It says Suncrest Terrace. Uh, it's on. Um, it's on the website. So if you go to the Otego County website, there's a tab on the left side of the website that says Departments. You navigate to the Departments and then you click on the Office of Real Property Tax Services. Yeah, it's the tax map. Yeah, yeah the tax map. So there's an online interactive website once you click on that department it should say like um otsego county gis and you click on that and then it'll take you to a page where you can navigate and type in the property address or the tab probably guess parcel number oh are you okay len okay sorry um you would just type it in type in that information and you would be able to navigate to a map a tax map showing that parcel and you click on the parcel and then it, it's I don't believe that pro that road is named. Harbor College has two parcels. This is not the parcel where any of the buildings are located. Yeah, this is a separate one. So, a separate so I guess parcel. we're we're adjourned, I guess. So you're right, the regular.